Section 29 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton. Section 29. Partition 1. Section 2. Member 2. Subsection 5. Bad air, a cause of melancholy. Air is a cause of great moment, in producing this or any other disease, being that it is still taken into our bodies by respiration, and our more inner parts. If it be impure and foggy, it dejects the spirits, and causeth diseases by infection of the heart, as Pauleth hath it. Book 1, Chapter 49, of Abicenna. Book 1, Galen, De Sanitate Tuenda. Mercurialis, Montaltus, etc. Fernelius saith, A thick air thickeneth the blood, and humours. Lemnius reckons up two main things most profitable, and most pernicious to our bodies, air and diet. And this peculiar disease, nothing sooner causeth, Gilbertus holds, than the air wherein we breathe and live. Such as is the air, such be our spirits, and as our spirits, such are our humours. It offends commonly if it be too hot and dry, thick, foliginous, cloudy, blustering, or a tempestuous air. Bodine, in his fifth book of his Method of History, proves that hot countries are most troubled with melancholy, and that there are therefore in Spain, Africa, and Asia Minor, great numbers of madmen, insomuch that they are compelled in all cities of note to build peculiar hospitals for them. Leo Afer, Book 3, De Fessa Urbe, Ortelius and Zwinga confirm as much. They are ordinarily so choleric in their speeches that scarce two words pass without railing or chiding in common talk, and often quarrelling in their streets. Gordonius will have every man take notice of it. Note this, saith he, that in hot countries it is far more familiar than in cold. Although this we have now said be not continually so, for as Acosta truly saith, under the equator itself is a most temperate habitation, wholesome air, a paradise of pleasure, the leaves ever green, cooling showers. But it holds in such as are intemperately hot, as Johannes and Megan found in Cyprus, others in Malta, Opulia, and the Holy Land, where at some seasons of the air is nothing but dust, their rivers dried up, their air scorching hot, and earth inflamed, insomuch that many pilgrims going barefoot for devotion's sake, from Joppa to Jerusalem upon the hot sands, often run mad, or else quite overwhelmed with sand, profundus arenis, as in many parts of Africa, Arabia deserta, Bactriana, now Karasan, when the west wind blows, in voluti arenis transuntis necantur. Hercules de Saxonia, a professor in Venice, gives this cause why so many Venetian women are melancholy. Quod du sub sole degant. They tarry too long in the sun. Montanus, amongst other causes, assigns this. Why that Jew his patient was mad, quod tam multum exposuit si calori et frigori, he exposed himself so much to heat and cold, and for that reason in Venice there is little stirring in those brick-paved streets in summer about noon. They are most part then asleep, as they are likewise in the great Mughals countries, and all over the East Indies. At Aden in Arabia, as Lodovicus Vertomanus relates in his travels, they keep their markets in the night, to avoid extremity of heat and in Ormus, like cattle in a pasture, people of all sorts lie up to the chin in water all day long. At Braga in Portugal, Burgos in Castile, Messina in Sicily, all over Spain and Italy, their streets are most part narrow to avoid the sunbeams. The Turks wear great turbans ad fuganda solis radios, to refract the sunbeams, and much inconvenience that hot air of Bantam in Java yields to our men that sojourn there for traffic, where it is so hot that they that are sick of the pox lie commonly bleaching in the sun to dry up their sores. Such a complaint I read of those isles of Cape Verde, fourteen degrees from the equator. They do male or dire. One calls them the unhealthiest clime of the world for fluxes, fevers, frenzies, calentures, which commonly seize on seafaring men that touch at them, and all by reason of a hot distemperature of the air. The hardiest men are offended with this heat, and the stiffest clowns cannot resist it, as Constantine affirms. 
They that are naturally born in such air may not endure it, as Niger records of some parts of Mesopotamia, now called Diabeca. Crubustum in locus saevienti aistui adio subjecta est, ut pleraque animalia fervore solis et coeli extinguantur. Tis so hot there in some places that men of the country and cattle are killed with it, and Adracomius of Arabia Felix, by reason of myrrh, frankincense, and hot spices there growing, the air is so obnoxious to their brains that the very inhabitants at some times cannot abide it, much less weaklings and strangers. Amatus Lusitanus reports of a young maid that was one Vincent, a courier's daughter, some thirteen years of age, that would wash her hair in the heat of the day, in July, and so let it dry in the sun to make it yellow. But by that means, tarrying too long in the heat, she inflamed her head and made herself mad. Cold air, in the other extreme, is almost as bad as hot, and so doth Montaltus esteem of it, chapter 11, if it be dry withal. In those northern countries, the people are therefore generally dull, heavy, and many witches, which, as I have before quoted, Saxo Grammaticus, Olaus, Baptista Porta, ascribed to melancholy. But these cold climes are more subject to natural melancholy, not this artificial, which is cold and dry, for which cause Mercurius Britannicus belike puts melancholy men to inhabit just under the pole. The worst of the three is a thick, cloudy, misty, foggy air, or such as come from fens, moorish grounds, lake, muck hills, draughts, sinks, where any carcasses or carrion lies, or from whence any stinking, fulsome smell comes. Galen, Avicenna, Mercurialis, new and old physicians, hold that such air is unwholesome, and engenders melancholy, plagues, and what not. Alexandretta, an haven town in the Mediterranean Sea, St. John de Ulloa, and haven in Nova Hispania, are much condemned for a bad air. So are Durazzo in Albania, Lithuania, Ditmarsh, Pomptini Paludes in Italy, the territories about Pisa, Ferrara, etc., Romney Marsh with us, the hundreds in Essex, the fens in Lincolnshire. Cardan, De Rerum Varietate, Book 17, Chapter 96, finds fault with the sight of those rich and most populous cities in the Low Countries, as Bruges, Gant, Amsterdam, Leiden, Utrecht, etc. The air is bad, and so at Stockholm in Sweden, Regium in Italy, Salisbury with us, Hull and Lynn. They may be commodious for navigation, this new kind of fortification, and many other good necessary uses, but are they so wholesome? Old Rome hath descended from the hills to the valley. Tis the site of most of our new cities, and held best to build in plains, to take the opportunity of rivers. Leander Albertus pleads hard for the air and sight of Venice, though the black Moorish lands appear at every low water. The sea, fire and smoke, as he thinks, qualify the air, and some suppose that a thick foggy air helps the memory, as in them of Pisa in Italy, and our Camden out of Plato, commends the sight of Cambridge, because it is so near the fens. But let the sight of such places be as it may, how can they be excused that have a delicious seat, a pleasant air, and all that nature can afford, and yet through their own meanness and sluttishness, immund and sordid manner of life, suffer their air to putrefy, and themselves to be chocked up? Many cities in Turkey do male audire in this kind, Constantinople itself, where commonly carrion lies in the street. Some find the same fault in Spain, even in Madrid, the king's seat, a most excellent air, a pleasant sight, but the inhabitants are slovens, and the streets uncleanly kept. A troublesome, tempestuous air is as bad as impure, rough, and foul weather, impetuous winds, cloudy dark days, as it is commonly with us. Coelum viso fedum, Polydor calls it a filthy sky, et in quo facile Gernerantur nubes, as Tully's brother Quintus wrote him in Rome, being then quaestor in Britain. In a thick and cloudy air, saith Lemnius, men are tetric, sad and peevish. And if the western winds blow, and that there be a calm or a fair sunshine day, there is a kind of alacrity in men's minds. It cheers up men and beasts. But if it be a turbulent, rough, cloudy, stormy weather, men are sad, lumpish, and much dejected, angry, waspish, dull, and melancholy. 
This was Virgil's experiment of old. Verum ubi tempestus, et quelli mobilis humo, mutavere vices, et Jupiter humidus astro, vertunto species animorum, et pectore motus, concipiunt alios. But when the face of heaven changed is, to tempests rain from season fair, our minds are altered, and in our breasts forthwith some new conceits appear. And who is not weatherwise against such and such conjunctions of planets, moved in foul weather, dull and heavy in such tempestuous seasons? Gelidum contristat aquarius annum. The time requires, and the autumn breeds it. Winter is like unto it, ugly, foul, squalid. The air works on all men, more or less, but especially on such as are melancholy, or inclined to it, as Lemnius holds. They are most moved with it, and those which are already mad rave downright, either in or against a tempest. Besides, the devil many times takes his opportunity of such storms, and when the humours by the air be stirred, he goes in with them, exagitates our spirits, and vexeth our souls. As the sea waves, so are the spirits and humours in our bodies tossed with tempestuous winds and storms. To such as are melancholy, therefore, Montanus will have tempestuous and rough air to be avoided, and all night air, and would not have them to walk abroad but in a pleasant day. Lemnius, Book 3, Chapter 3, discommends the south and eastern winds, commends the north. Montanus will not any windows to be opened in the night. He discommends especially the south wind and nocturnal air. So doth Plutarch. The night and darkness makes men sad. The like do all subterranean vaults, dark houses in caves and rocks, desert places cause melancholy in an instant, especially such as have not been used to it, or otherwise accustomed. Read more of air in Hippocrates, Aetius, Oribasius, Avicenna, etc. End of section 29《Section 30 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 30. Partition 1, Section 2, Member 2, Subsections 6 and 7. Subsection 6. Immoderate exercise, a cause, and how. Solitariness, idleness. Nothing so good, but it may be abused. Nothing better than exercise, if opportunely used, for the preservation of the body. Nothing so bad, if it be unseasonable, violent, or overmuch. Fernelius out of Galen saith that much exercise and weariness consumes the spirits and substance, refrigerates the body, and such humours which nature would have otherwise concocted and expelled, it stirs up and makes them rage, which being so enraged, diversely affect and trouble the body and mind. So doth it, if it be unseasonably used upon a full stomach or when the body is full of crudities, which Buxius so much inveighs against, giving that for a cause, why schoolboys in Germany are so often scabbed, because they use exercise presently after meats. Byrus puts in a caveat against such exercise, because it corrupts the meat in the stomach, and carries the same juice raw, and as yet undigested into the veins, saith Lemnius, which there putrefies and confounds the animal spirits. Crato protests against all such exercise after meat as being the greatest enemy to concoction that may be, and cause of corruption of humours, which produce this and many other diseases. Not without good reason then doth Salustius Silvianus and Leonartus Jacinus in nine races mercurialis arcubanus and many other set down immoderate exercise as a most forcible cause of melancholy opposite to exercise is idleness the badge of gentry or want of exercise the bane of body and mind the nurse of naughtiness stepmother of discipline the chief author of all mischief 
one of the seven deadly sins, and a sole cause of this and many other maladies, the devil's cushion, as Gwalter calls it, his pillow and chief reposal. For the mind can never rest, but still meditates on one thing or other, except it be occupied about some honest business. Of his own accord it rusheth into melancholy. As too much and violent exercise offends on the one side, so doth an idle life on the other, saith Crato. It fills the body full of phlegm, gross humours, and all manner of obstructions, rheums, catars, etc. Rhesus accounts of it as the greatest cause of melancholy. I have often seen, saith he, that idleness begets this humour more than anything else. Montaltus chapter 1 seconds him out of his experience. They that are idle are far more subject to melancholy than such as are conversant or employed about any office or business. Plutarch reckons up idleness for a sole cause of the sickness of the soul. There are they, saith he, troubled in mind, that have no other cause but this. Homer, Iliad 1, brings in Achilles, eating of his own heart in his idleness, because he might not fight. Mercurialis, for a melancholy young man, urgeth it as a chief cause. Why was he melancholy? Because idle. Nothing begets it sooner, increaseth and continueth it oftener than idleness. A disease familiar to all idle persons, an inseparable companion to such as live at ease. Pingui otio desidiose agentis, a life out of action, and have no calling or ordinary employment to busy themselves about, that have small occasions, and though they have, such is their laziness, dullness, they will not compose themselves to do aught, they cannot abide work, though it be necessary, easy as to dress themselves, write a letter, or the like. Yet as he that is benumbed with cold, sits still shaking, that might relieve himself with a little exercise or stirring, do they complain, but will not use the facile and ready means to do themselves good, and so are still tormented with melancholy, especially if they have been formerly brought up to business, or to keep much company, and upon a sudden come to lead a sedentary life, it crucifies their souls, and seizeth on them in an instant, for whilst they are anyways employed, in action, discourse, about any business, sport, or recreation, or in company to their liking, they are very well, but if alone or idle, tormented instantly again, one day's solitariness, one hour's sometimes, doth them more harm than a week's physic, labour and company can do good. Melancholy seizeth on them forthwith being alone, and is such a torture, that as wise Seneca well saith, malo mihi male quam malito esse, I had rather be sick than idle, this idleness is either a body or mind. That a body is nothing but a kind of benumbing laziness, intermitting exercise, which, if we may believe Fernelius, causeth crudities, obstructions, excremental humours, quencheth the natural heat, dulls the spirits, and makes them unapt to do anything whatsoever. Neglectus orenda felix inascitur agris, for a neglected field, shall for the fire its thorns and thistles yield. As fern grows in untilled grounds, and all manner of weeds, so do gross humours in an idle body. Ignavum corrumpunt otia corpus, a horse in a stable that never travels, a hawk in a mew, that seldom flies, are both subject to diseases, which left unto themselves are most free from any such encumbrances. An idle dog will be mangy, and how shall an idle person think to escape? Idleness of the mind is much worse than this of the body. Wit without employment is a disease. Irogo animi, rubigo ingeni. 
the rust of the soul, a plague, a hell itself. Maximum animi nocumentum, Galen calls it. As in a standing pool, worms and filthy creepers increase, et vitium capiunt ni moviantur aquae. The water itself putrefies, the air likewise, if it be not continually stirred by the wind, so do evil and corrupt thoughts in an idle person. The soul is contaminated. In a commonwealth, where is no public enemy, there is likely civil wars, and they rage upon themselves. This body of ours, when it is idle, and knows not how to bestow itself, macerates and vexeth itself with cares, griefs, false fears, discontents, and suspicions. It tortures and preys upon his own bowels, and is never at rest. Thus much I dare boldly say, he or she that is idle, be they of what condition they will, never so rich, so well allied, fortunate, happy, let them have all things in abundance, and felicity that heart can wish and desire, all contentment, so long as he or she or they are idle, they shall never be pleased, never well in body and mind, but weary still, sickly still, vexed still, loathing still, weeping, sighing, grieving, suspecting, offended with the world, with every object, wishing themselves gone or dead, or else earned away with some foolish fantasy or other. And this is the true cause that so many great men, ladies, and gentlewomen labour of this disease in country and city, for idleness is an appendix to nobility. They count it a disgrace to work, and spend all their days in sports, recreations, and pastimes and will therefore take no pains, be of no vocation. They feed liberally, fare well, want exercise, action, employment. For to work, I say, they may not abide, and company to their desires, and thence their bodies, become full of gross humours, wind, crudities, their minds disquieted, dull, heavy, etc., care, jealousy, fear of some diseases, sullen fits, weeping fits, seize too familiarly on them. For what will not fear and fantasy work in an idle body? What distempers will they not cause? When the children of Israel murmured against Pharaoh in Egypt, he commanded his officers to double their task and let them get straw themselves, and yet make their full number of bricks for the sole cause why they mutiny and are evil at ease is they are idle when you shall hear and see so many discontented persons in all places where you come so many several grievances unnecessary complaints fears suspicions the best means to redress it is to set them a work so to busy their minds for the truth is they are idle well they may build castles in the air for a time and soothe up themselves with fantastical and pleasant humours but in the end they will prove as bitter as gall they shall be still i say discontent suspicious fearful jealous sad fretting and vexing of themselves so long as they be idle it is impossible to please them otio qui nesceruti plus habet negoti quam qui negotium in negotio as that agellius could observe he that knows not how to spend his time hath more business care grief anguish of mind than he that is most busy in the midst of all his business otiosus animus nescit quid volet an idle person as he follows it knows not when he is well what he would have or whither he would go whom illuquentum est illing lubet he is tired out with everything displeased with all weary of his life nec benidome nec militiae neither at home nor abroad erat et praetor vitum vivitur he wanders and lives besides himself 
in a word what the mischievous effects of laziness and idleness are i do not find anywhere more accurately expressed than in these verses of philolochies in the comical poet which for their elegancy i will in part insert novarum idium esse arbitur similum ego hominem quando hic natus est aere argumentum dicum idis quando sunt ad musum expolitae quisque laudet fabrum atque exemplum expetit etc ad ubi illo migrat nequam homo indiligensque etc tempestis venit confringit degolas imbricesque putrifacit aer operum fabri etc dicam at hominis similis esse idium arbitremini fabri parentis fundamentum substruent liberorum expoliunt dogen literas nec parcunt sumptui ego altum sub fabrorum potestate frugifui post quam autum migravi in ingenium meum perditi operum fabrorum illico opido veni dignavia e mihi tempestas vid ad ventuque suo grandinum et imbram atulit illa mihi virtutum deturbavit etc a young man is like a fair new house a carpenter leaves it well built in good repair of solid stuff but a bad tenant lets it rein in and for want of reparation fall to decay etc our parents tutors friends spare no cost to bring us up in our youth in all manner of virtuous education but when we are left to ourselves idleness as a tempest drives all virtuous motions out of our minds et nili sumus on a sudden by sloth and such bad ways we come to naught cousin german to idleness and a concomitant cause which goes hand in hand with it is nemia solitudo too much solitariness by the testimony of all physicians cause and symptom both but as it is here put for a cause it is either coact enforced or else voluntary enforced solitariness is commonly seen in students monks friars anchorites that by their order and course of life must abandon all company society of other men and betake themselves to a private cell otio superstitioso seclusi as bale and hospinian well term it such as are the carthusians of our time that eat no flesh by their order keep perpetual silence never go abroad such as live in prison or some desert place and cannot have company as many of our country gentlemen do in solitary houses they must either be alone without companions or live beyond their means and entertain all comers as so many hosts or else converse with their servants and hinds such as are unequal inferior to them and of a contrary disposition or else as some do to avoid solitariness spend their time with lewd fellows in taverns and in alehouses and thence addict themselves to some unlawful disports or dissolute courses divers again are cast upon this rock of solitariness for want of means or out of a strong apprehension of some infirmity disgrace or through bashfulness rudeness simplicity they cannot apply themselves to others company nullum solum infelici gratius solitudine ubi nullus sit qui miserium exprobrit this enforced solitariness takes place and produceth his effect soonest in such as have spent their time jovially peradventure in all honest recreations in good company in some great family or populous city and are upon a sudden confined to a desert country cottage far off restrained of their liberty and barred from their ordinary associates solitariness is very irksome to such 
most tedious and a sudden cause of great inconvenience voluntary solitariness is that which is familiar with melancholy and gently brings on like a siren a shoeing horn or some sphinx to this irrevocable gulf a primary cause piso calls it most pleasant it is at first to such as are melancholy given to lie in bed whole days and keep their chambers to walk alone in some solitary grove betwixt wood and water by a brookside to meditate upon some delightsome and pleasant subject which shall affect them most amabilis insania et mentis gratissimus error a most incomparable delight it is so to melancholize and build castles in the air to go smiling to themselves acting an infinite variety of parts which they suppose and strongly imagine they represent or that they see acted or done blandi quidem ab ignitio saith lemnius to conceive and meditate of such pleasant things sometimes present past or to come as rhasis speaks so delightsome these toys are at first they could spend whole days and nights without sleep even whole years alone in such contemplations and fantastical meditations which are like unto dreams and they will hardly be drawn from them or willingly interrupt so pleasant their vain conceits are that they hinder their ordinary tasks and necessary business they cannot address themselves to them or almost to any study or employment these fantastical and bewitching thoughts so covertly so feelingly so urgently so continually set upon creep in insinuate possess overcome distract and detain them they cannot i say go about their more necessary business stave off or extricate themselves but are ever musing melancholizing and carried along as he they say that is led round about a heath with a puck in the night they run earnestly on in this labyrinth of anxious and solicitous melancholy meditations and cannot well or willingly refrain or easily leave off winding and unwinding themselves as so many clocks and still pleasing their humours until at last the scene is turned upon a sudden by some bad object and they being now habituated to such vain meditations and solitary places can endure no company can ruminate of nothing but harsh and distasteful subjects fear sorrow suspicion sub rusticus pudor discontent cares and weariness of life surprise them in a moment and they can think of nothing else continually suspecting no sooner are their eyes open but this infernal plague of melancholy seizeth on them and terrifies their souls representing some dismal object to their minds which now by no means no labour no persuasions they can avoid hyret lateri litholis arundo the arrow of death still remains in the side they may not be rid of it they cannot resist i may not deny but that there is some profitable meditation contemplation and kind of solitariness to be embraced which the fathers so highly commended hiram chrysostom cyprian austin in whole tracts which petrarch erasmus stella and others so much magnify in their books a paradise a heaven on earth if it be used aright good for the body and better for the soul as many of those old monks used it to divine contemplations as simulus a courtier in adrian's time diocletian the emperor retired themselves etc in that sense watia solus git vivere watia lives alone which the romans were wont to say when they commended a country life 
or to the bettering of their knowledge, as Democritus, Cleanthes, and those excellent philosophers have ever done, to sequester themselves from the tumultuous world, or, as in Pliny's Villa Laurentana, Tully's Tusculum, Jovius' study, that they might better vacare studius et deo, serve God and follow their studies. Methinks, therefore, our two zealous innovators were not so well advised in that general subversion of abbeys and religious houses, promiscuously to fling down all. They might have taken away those gross abuses, crept in amongst them, rectified such inconveniences, and not so far to have raved and raged against those fair buildings and everlasting monuments of our forefathers' devotion, consecrated to pious uses. Some monasteries and collegiate cells might have been well spared, and their revenues otherwise employed, here and there one in good towns or cities at least, for men and women of all sorts and conditions to live in to sequester themselves from the cares and tumults of the world that were not desirous or fit to marry or otherwise willing to be troubled with common affairs and know not well where to bestow themselves to live apart in for more conveniency good education better company's sake to follow their studies i say to the perfection of arts and sciences common good and as some truly devoted monks of old had done freely and truly to serve god for these men are neither solitary nor idle as the poet made answer to the husbandman in aesop that objected idleness to him he was never so idle as in his company or that scipio africanus in tuli nun quam minus solus quam cum solus nun quam minus otiosus quam cum esset otiosus never less solitary than when he was alone never more busy than when he seemed to be most idle it is reported by plato in his dialogue de amore in that prodigious commendation of socrates how a deep meditation coming into socrates mind by chance he stood still musing eodem vestigio cogitabundus from morning to noon and when as then he had not yet finished his meditation per stabat cogitans he so continued till the evening the soldiers for he then followed the camp observed him with admiration and on set purpose watched all night but he persevered immovable ad exhortem solis till the sun rose in the morning and then saluting the sun went his ways in what humour constant socrates did thus i know not or how he might be affected but this would be pernicious to another man what intricate business might so really possess him i cannot easily guess but this is otiosum otium it is far otherwise with these men according to seneca omnia nobis mala solitudo persuadit this solitude undoeth us pugnat cum vita sociali tis a destructive solitariness these men are devils alone as the saying is homo solus aut deus aut daemon a man alone is either a saint or a devil mens eus aut languescit aut tumescit and why soli in this sense woe be to him that is so alone these wretches do frequently degenerate from men and of sociable creatures become beasts monsters inhumane ugly to behold misanthropi they do even loathe themselves and hate the company of men as so many timons nebuchadnezzars by too much indulging to these pleasing humours and through their own default so that which mercurialis sometimes expostulated with his melancholy patient may be justly applied to every solitary and idle person in particular natura de te videtur conquere posse etc 
Nature may justly complain of thee, that whereas she gave thee a good wholesome temperature, a sound body, and God hath given thee so divine and excellent a soul, so many good parts and profitable gifts thou hast not only condemned and rejected, but hast corrupted them, polluted them, overthrown their temperature, and perverted those gifts with riot, idleness, solitariness, and many other ways. Thou art a traitor to God and nature, an enemy to thyself and to the world. Perditio tua ex te. Thou hast lost thyself willfully, cast away thyself, Thou thyself art the efficient cause of thine own misery, by not resisting such vain cogitations, but giving way unto them. Subsection 7. Sleeping and Waking. Causes. What I have formerly said of exercise, I may now repeat of sleep. Nothing better than moderate sleep, nothing worse than it, if it be in extremes, or unseasonably used. It is a received opinion that a melancholy man cannot sleep over much, somnus supramodum prodest, as an only antidote, and nothing offends them more, or causeth this malady sooner than waking. Yet in some cases sleep may do more harm than good, in that phlegmatic, swinish, cold and sluggish melancholy, which Melanchthon speaks of, that thinks of waters, sighing most part, etc. It dulls the spirits, if overmuch, and senses, fills the head full of gross humours, causeth distillations, rheums, great store of excrements in the brain, and all the other parts, as Fuxius speaks of them, that sleep like so many dormice, or if it be used in the daytime, upon a full stomach, the body ill-composed to rest, or after hard meats, it increaseth fearful dreams, incubus, night-walking, crying out, and much unquietness. Such sleep prepares the body, as one observes, to many perilous diseases. But as I have said, waking overmuch is both a symptom and an ordinary cause. It causeth dryness of the brain, frenzy, dotage, and makes the body dry, lean, hard, and ugly to behold, as Lemnius hath it. The temperature of the brain is corrupted by it, the humours adust, the eyes made to sink into the head, choler increased, and the whole body inflamed and as may be added out of Galen, 3, De Sanitato Tuendo, Avicenna, 3, 1, it overthrows the natural heat, it causeth crudities, hurts, concoction, and what not, not without good cause therefore, Crato, Hildesheim, Jocinus, Arculanus on Rhesus, Guianarius and Mercurialis, reckon up this overmuch waking as a principal cause. End of section 30. Section 31 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 31, Partition 1, Section 2, Member 3, Subsections 1 and 2, Subsection 1, Passions and Perturbations of the Mind, How They Cause Melancholy. As that gymnosophist in Plutarch made answer to Alexander, demanding which spake best. Every one of his fellows did speak better than the other. So may I say of these causes, to him that shall require which is the greatest. Every one is more grievous than other, and this of passion the greatest of all. A most frequent and ordinary cause of melancholy, Fulmen perturbationum, Piccolomineus calls it, this thunder and lightning of perturbation, which causeth 
such violent and speedy alterations in this our microcosm, and many times subverts the good estate and temperature of it. For as the body works upon the mind by his bad humours, troubling the spirits, sending gross fumes into the brain, and so, per consequence, disturbing the soul and all the faculties of it. Corpus onustum, hesternis vitius animum, quoque pragravat una, with fear, sorrow, etc., which are ordinary symptoms of this disease, so on the other side, the mind most effectually works upon the body, producing by his passions and perturbations, miraculous alterations, as melancholy, despair, cruel diseases, and sometimes death itself, insomuch that it is most true, which Plato saith in his Carmides, omnia corporis mala ab anima procedere, all the mischiefs of the body proceed from the soul, and Democritus in Plutarch urgeth domnatum ir animum a corpore. If the body should in this behalf bring an action against the soul, surely the soul would be cast and convicted that by her supine negligence hath caused such inconveniences, having authority over the body, and using it for an instrument. As a smith doth his hammer, saith Cyprian, imputing all those vices and maladies to the mind, even so doth Philostratus, non coinquinator corpus nisi consensuanimae. The body is not corrupted, but by the soul. Ludovicus Vivus will have such turbulent commotions proceed from ignorance and indiscretion. All philosophers impute the miseries of the body to the soul, that should have governed it better, by command of reason, and hath not done it. The Stoics are altogether of opinion, as Lipsius and Piccolomineus record, that a wise man should be apathis, without all manner of passions and perturbations whatsoever, as Seneca reports of Cato, the Greeks of Socrates, and Johannes Obanus of a nation in Africa, so free from passion, or rather so stupid, that if they be wounded with a sword, they will only look back. Lactantius, tu divinarum institutionum, will exclude fear from a wise man. Others accept all, some the greatest passions. But let them dispute how they will, set down in thesi, give precepts to the contrary. We find that of Lemnius true by common experience. No mortal man is free from these perturbations. Or if he be so, sure he is either a god, or a block. They are born and bred with us. We have them from our parents by inheritance. A parentibus habemus malum hunc asum, saith Palasius, nascitur una nobiscum aliturque. Tis propagated from Adam. Cain was melancholy, as Austin hath it, and who is not? Good discipline, education, philosophy, divinity, I cannot deny, may mitigate and restrain these passions in some few men at some times but most part they domineer and are so violent that as a torrent torrens velut agere rupto bears down all before and overflows his banks sternit agro sternit sata lays waste the fields prostrates the crops they overwhelm reason judgment and pervert the temperature of the body. Fertur equis auriga, nec audit curus habinas. Now such a man, saith Austin, that is so led, in a wise man's eye, is no better than he that stands upon his head. It is doubted by some. Gravior est ni morbi a perturbationibus an ab humoribus. Whether humours or perturbations cause the more grievous maladies, but we find that of our Saviour, Matthew 26, 41, most true. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, we cannot resist. And this of Philo Judaeus, perturbations often offend the body, and are most frequent causes of melancholy, turning it out of the hinges of his health. Vivus compares them to winds upon the sea, some only move as those great gales, but others, turbulent, quite overturn the ship. 
those which are light, easy, and more seldom, to our thinking, do us little harm, and are therefore condemned of us. Yet if they be reiterated, as the rain, saith Austin, doth a stone, so do these perturbations penetrate the mind, and, as one observes, produce a habit of melancholy at the last, which having gotten the mastery in our souls, may well be called diseases. How these passions produce this effect, Agrippa hath handled at large, De Occulta Philosophia, Book 11, Chapter 63, Cardan, Book 14, De Subtilitate Rerum, Lemnius, Book 1, Chapter 12, De Miraculis Occultis Natura, and Book 1, Chapter 16, Suarez, Disputationis Metaphysicae, 18, Section 1, Article 25, Timothy Bright, Chapter 12, of his Melancholy Treatise, Write the Jesuit, in his Book of the Passions of the Mind, etc., Thus, in brief, to our imagination cometh by the outward sense of memory some object to be known, residing in the foremost part of the brain, which he, misconceiving or amplifying, presently communicates to the heart, the seat of all affections. The pure spirits forthwith flock from the brain to the heart by certain secret channels, and signify what good or bad object was presented, which immediately bends itself to prosecute or avoid it, and withal draweth with it other humours to help it. So in pleasure concur great store of purer spirits, in sadness much melancholy blood, in ire choler. If the imagination be very apprehensive, intent, and violent, it sends great store of spirits to or from the heart and makes a deeper impression and greater tumult as the humours in the body be likewise prepared and the temperature itself ill or well disposed the passions are longer and stronger so that the first step and fountain of all our grievances in this kind is lysa imaginatio which misinforming the heart causeth all these distemperatures, alteration, and confusion of spirits and humours, by means of which, so disturbed, concoction is hindered, and the principal parts are much debilitated, as Dr. Navarra well declared, being consulted by Montanus about a melancholy Jew, the spirits so confounded, the nourishment must needs be abated, bad humours increased, crudities and thick spirits engendered with melancholy blood the other parts cannot perform their functions having the spirits drawn from them by vehement passion but fail in sense and motion so we look upon a thing and see it not hear and observe not which otherwise would much affect us had we been free i may therefore conclude with arnaldus maxima vis est phantasiae et huic unifere non autum corporis intemperiae omnis melancholiae causa est ascribenda great is the force of imagination and much more ought the cause of melancholy to be ascribed to this alone than to the distemperature of the body of which imagination because it hath so great a stroke in producing this malady and is so powerful of itself it will not be improper to my discourse to make a brief digression and speak of the force of it and how it causeth this alteration which manner of digression howsoever some dislike as frivolous and impertinent yet i am of Baroaldus' opinion such digressions do mightily delight and refresh a weary breeder they are like sauce to a bad stomach and i do therefore most willingly use them subsection two of the force of imagination what imagination is i have sufficiently declared in my digression of the anatomy of the soul i will only now point at the wonderful effects and power of it which as it is eminent in all so most especially it rageth in melancholy persons in keeping the species of objects so long mistaking amplifying them by continual and strong meditation until at length it produceth 
in some parties real effects causeth this and many other maladies and although this fantasy of ours be a subordinate faculty to reason and should be ruled by it yet in many men through inward or outward distemperatures defect of organs which are unapt or otherwise contaminated it is likewise unapt or hindered and hurt this we see verified in sleepers which by reason of humours and concourse of vapours troubling the fantasy imagine many times absurd and prodigious things and in such as are troubled with incubus or witch-ridden as we call it if they lie on their backs they suppose an old woman rides and sits so hard upon them that they are almost stifled for want of breath when there is nothing offends but a concourse of bad humours which trouble the fantasy this is likewise evident in such as walk in the night in their sleep and do strange feats these vapours move the fantasy the fantasy the appetite which moving the animal spirits causeth the body to walk up and down as if they were awake fracastorius book three de intellectione refers all ecstasies to this force of imagination such as lie whole days together in a trance as that priest whom celsus speaks of that could separate himself from his senses when he list and lie like a dead man void of life and sense cardan brags of himself that he could do as much and that when he list many times such men when they come to themselves tell strange things of heaven and hell what visions they have seen as that st owen in matthew paris that went into st patrick's purgatory and the monk of evesham in the same author those common apparitions in bede and gregory st bridget's revelations wierus book three de lamius chapter eleven caesar vaninus in his dialogues reduceth as i have formerly said with all those tales of witches progresses dancing riding transformations operations etc to the force of imagination and the devil's illusions the like effects almost are to be seen in such as are awake how many chimeras antics golden mountains and castles in the air do they build unto themselves i appeal to painters mechanicians mathematicians some ascribe all vices to a false and corrupt imagination anger revenge lust ambition covetousness which prefers falsehood before that which is right and good deluding the soul with false shows and suppositions bernardus panotus will have heresy and superstition to proceed from this fountain as he falsely imagineth so he believeth and as he conceiveth of it so it must be and it shall be contra gentis he will have it so but most especially in passions and affections it shows strange and evident effects what will not a fearful man conceive in the dark what strange forms of bugbears devils witches goblins lavater imputes the greatest cause of spectrums and the like apparitions to fear which above all other passions begets the strongest imagination saith wierus and so likewise love sorrow joy etc some die suddenly as she that saw her son come from the battle at cannae etc jacob the patriarch by force of imagination made speckled lambs laying speckled rods before his sheep persina that ethiopian queen in heliodorus by seeing the picture of perseus and andromeda instead of a blackamoor was brought to bed of a fair white child in imitation of whom belike a hard favoured fellow in greece because he and his wife were both deformed to get a good brood of children elegantissimus imagines in thalamo colocavit etc hung the fairest pictures he could buy for money in his chamber 
that his wife by frequent sight of them might conceive and bear such children and if we may believe bale one of pope nicholas the third's concubines by seeing of a bear was brought to bed of a monster if a woman saith lemnius at the time of her conception think of another man present or absent the child will be like him great bellied women when they long yield us prodigious examples in this kind as moles warts scars hair lips monsters especially caused in their children by force of a depraved fantasy in them ipsum specium quan animo effigiat fitui inducit she imprints that stamp upon her child which she conceives unto herself and therefore ludovicus vivus book two de institutione feminae christianae gives a special caution to great bellied women that they do not admit such absurd conceits and cogitations but by all means avoid those horrible objects heard or seen or filthy spectacles some will laugh weep sigh groan blush tremble sweat at such things as are suggested unto them by their imagination avicenna speaks of one that could cast himself into a palsy when he list and some can imitate the tunes of birds and beasts that they can hardly be discerned dagobertus and st francis scars and wounds like those of christ's if at the least any such were agrippa supposeth to have happened by force of imagination that some are turned to wolves from men to women and women again to men which is constantly believed to the same imagination or from men to asses dogs or any other shapes wierus ascribes all those famous transformations to imagination that in hydrophobia they seem to see the picture of a dog still in their water that melancholy men and sick men conceive so many fantastical visions apparitions to themselves and have such absurd apparitions as that they are kings lords cocks bears apes owls that they are heavy light transparent great and little senseless and dead as shall be showed more at large in our sections of symptoms can be imputed to naught else but to a corrupt false and violent imagination it works not in sick and melancholy men only but even most forcibly sometimes in such as are sound it makes them suddenly sick and alters their temperature in an instant and sometimes a strong conceit or apprehension as valesius proves will take away diseases in both kinds it will produce real effects men if they see but another man tremble giddy or sick of some fearful disease their apprehension and fear is so strong in this kind that they will have the same disease or if by some soothsayer wise man fortune-teller or physician they be told they shall have such a disease they will so seriously apprehend it that they will instantly labour of it a thing familiar in china saith riccius the jesuit if it be told them they shall be sick on such a day when that day comes they will surely be sick and will be so terribly afflicted that sometimes they die upon it dr cotta in his discovery of ignorant practitioners of physic chapter eight hath two strange stories to this purpose what fancy is able to do the one of a parson's wife in northamptonshire anno sixteen o seven that coming to a physician and told by him that she was troubled with the sciatica as he conjectured a disease she was free from the same night after her return upon his words fell into a grievous fit of a sciatica and such another example he hath of another good wife that was so troubled with the cramp after the same manner she came by it because her physician did but name it sometimes death itself is caused by force of fantasy i have heard of one that coming by chance in company of him that was thought to be sick of the plague 
which was not so, fell down suddenly dead. Another was sick of the plague with conceit. One, seeing his fellow let blood, falls down in a swoon. Another, saith Cardan out of Aristotle, fell down dead, which is familiar to women at any ghastly sight, seeing but a man hanged. A Jew in France, saith Ludovicus Vivus, came by chance over a dangerous passage or plank that lay over a brook in the dark without harm the next day perceiving what danger he was in fell down dead many will not believe such stories to be true but laugh commonly and deride when they hear of them but let these men consider with themselves as peter byrus illustrates it if they were set to walk upon a plank on high they would be giddy upon which they dare securely walk upon the ground many saith agrippa strong-hearted men otherwise tremble at such sights dazzle and are sick if they look but down from a high place and what moves them but conceit as some are so molested by fantasy so some again by fancy alone and a good conceit are as easily recovered we see commonly the toothache gout falling sickness biting of a mad dog and many such maladies cured by spells words characters and charms and many green wounds by that now so much used unguentum armarium magnetically cured which crolius and goclenius in a book of late hath defended libavius in a just tract as stiffly contradicts and most men controvert all the world knows there is no virtue in such charms or cures but a strong conceit and opinion alone as pomponatius holds which forceth a motion of the humours spirits and blood which takes away the cause of the malady from the parts affected the like we may say of our magical effects superstitious cures and such as are done by mountebanks and wizards as by wicked incredulity many men are hurt so saith wierus of charms spells etc we find in our experience by the same means many are relieved and empiric oftentimes and a silly chirurgeon doth more strange cures than a rational physician nemanus gives a reason because the patient puts his confidence in him which avicenna prefers before art precepts and all remedies whatsoever tis opinion alone saith cardan which makes or mars physicians and he doth the best cures according to hippocrates in whom most trust so diversely doth this fantasy of ours affect turn and wind so imperiously command our bodies which as another proteus or a chameleon can take all shapes and is of such force as facinus adds that it can work upon others as well as ourselves how can otherwise blear eyes in one man cause the like affliction in another why doth one man's yawning make another yawn one man's pissing provoke a second many times to do the like why doth the scraping of trenchers offend a third or hacking of files why doth the carcass bleed when the murderer is brought before it some weeks after the murder hath been done why do witches and old women fascinate and bewitch children but as wierus paracelsus cardan misaldus valeriola caesar vaninus campanella and many philosophers think the forcible imagination of the one party moves and alters the spirits of the other nay more they can cause and cure not only diseases maladies and several infirmities by this means as avicenna supposeth in parties remote but move bodies from their places cause thunder lightning tempests which opinion alkindus paracelsus and some others approve of so that i may certainly conclude this strong conceit or imagination is astrum hominis and the rudder of this our ship which reason should steer but overborne by fantasy cannot manage 
as so suffers itself and this whole vessel of ours to be overruled and often overturned read more of this in wirus book three de lamius chapters eight nine ten franciscus valesius controversiarium medicarum et philosophicarum book five marcellus donatus book two chapter one medica historia mirabilis levinus lemnius de miraculis occultis naturae book one chapter twelve cardan book eighteen de rarum varietate cornelius agrippa de occulta philosophia chapters sixty four sixty five camerarius first centuria chapter fifty four horarum succissiorum nimanus laurentius and him that is instar omnium finus a famous physician of antwerp that wrote three books de viribus imaginationis i have thus far digressed because this imagination is the medium deferens of passions by whose means they work and produce many times prodigious effects and as the fantasy is more or less intended or remitted and their humours disposed so do perturbations move more or less and take deeper impression end of section thirty one section thirty two of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section thirty two partition one section two member three subsections three through six subsection three division of perturbations perturbations and passions which trouble the fantasy though they dwell between the confines of sense and reason yet they rather follow sense than reason because they are drowned in corporeal organs of sense they are commonly reduced into two inclinations irascible and concupiscible the thomas subdivide them into eleven six in the coveting and five in the invading aristotle reduceth all to pleasure and pain plato to love and hatred vivus to good and bad if good it is present and then we absolutely joy and love or to come and then we desire and hope for it if evil we absolutely hate it if present it is by sorrow if to come fear these four passions bernard compares to the wheels of a chariot by which we are carried in this world all other passions are subordinate unto these four or six as some will love joy desire hatred sorrow fear the rest as anger envy emulation pride jealousy anxiety mercy shame discontent despair ambition avarice etc are reducible unto the first and if they be immoderate they consume the spirits and melancholy is especially caused by them some few discreet men there are that can govern themselves and curb in these inordinate affections by religion philosophy and such divine precepts of meekness patience and the like but most part for want of government out of indiscretion ignorance they suffer themselves wholly to be led by sense and are so far from repressing rebellious inclinations that they give all encouragement unto them leaving the reins and using all provocations to further them bad by nature worse by art discipline custom education and a perverse will of their own they follow on wheresoever their unbridled affections will transport them and do more out of custom self-will than out of reason contumax voluntas as melanchthon calls it malum faci this stubborn will of ours perverts judgment which sees and knows what should and ought to be done and yet will not do it mancipia gulae slaves to their several lusts and appetites they precipitate and plunge themselves into a labyrinth of cares blinded with lust blinded with ambition they seek that at god's hands which they may give unto themselves 
if they could but refrain from those cares and perturbations wherewith they continually macerate their minds but giving way to these violent passions of fear grief shame revenge hatred malice etc they are torn in pieces as actian was with his dogs and crucify their own souls subsection four sorrow a cause of melancholy sorrow insanus dolor in this catalogue of passions which so much torment the soul of man and cause this malady for i will briefly speak of them all and in their order the first place in this irascible appetite may justly be challenged by sorrow an inseparable companion the mother and daughter of melancholy her epitome symptom and chief cause as hippocrates hath it they beget one another and tread in a ring for sorrow is both cause and symptom of this disease how it is a symptom shall be shown in its place that it is a cause all the world acknowledgeth dolor non nullis insaniae causa fuit et aliorum morborum insanabilium saith plutarch to apollonius a cause of madness a cause of many other diseases a sole cause of this mischief lemnius calls it so doth rhasis guianarius and if it take root once it ends in despair as felix plater observes and as in cebus table may well be coupled with it chrysostom in his seventeenth epistle to olympia describes it to be a cruel torture of the soul a most inexplicable grief poisoned worm consuming body and soul and gnawing the very heart a perpetual executioner continual night profound darkness a whirlwind a tempest an ague not appearing heating worse than any fire and a battle that hath no end it crucifies worse than any tyrant no torture no strappato no bodily punishment is like unto it tis the eagle without question which the poets feign to gnaw prometheus heart and no heaviness is like unto the heaviness of the heart ecclesiastes twenty five fifteen sixteen every perturbation is a misery but grief a cruel torment a domineering passion as in old rome when the dictator was created all inferior magistracies ceased when grief appears all other passions vanish it dries up the bones saith solomon chapter seventeen proverbs makes them hollow-eyed pale and lean furrow-faced to have dead looks wrinkled brows shrivelled cheeks dry bodies and quite perverts their temperature that are misaffected with it as eleonora that exiled mournful duchess in our english ovid laments to her noble husband humphrey duke of gloucester sawest thou those eyes in whose sweet cheerful look duke humphrey wants such joy and pleasure took sorrow hath so despoiled me of all grace thou couldst not say this was my elnor's face like a foul gorgon etc it hinders concoction refrigerates the heart takes away stomach colour and sleep thickens the blood Fernalius, book one chapter eighteen de morborum causis contaminates the spirits piso overthrows the natural heat perverts the good estate of body and mind and makes them weary of their lives cry out howl and roar for very anguish of their souls david confessed as much psalm thirty eight eight i have roared for the very disquietness of my heart and psalm one nineteen part four verse four my soul melteth away for very heaviness verse thirty eight i am like a bottle in the smoke antiochus complained that he could not sleep and that his heart fainted for grief christ himself vir dolorum out of an apprehension of grief did sweat blood mark fourteen his soul was heavy to the death and no sorrow was like unto his crato gives instance in one that was so melancholy by reason of grief and montanus in a noble matron that had no other cause of this mischief i s d in hildesheim fully cured a patient of his that was much troubled with melancholy and for many years but afterwards by a little occasion of sorrow he fell into his former fits and was tormented as before 
examples are common how it causeth melancholy desperation and sometimes death itself for ecclesiastes thirty eight fifteen of heaviness comes death worldly sorrow causeth death second corinthians seven ten psalms thirty one ten my life is wasted with heaviness and my years with mourning why was hecuba said to be turned to a dog niobe into a stone but that for grief she was senseless and stupid severus the emperor died for grief and how many myriads besides tanta iliest veritas tanta est insania luctus melanchthon gives a reason of it the gathering of much melancholy blood about the heart which collection extinguisheth good spirits or at least dulleth them sorrow strikes the heart makes it tremble and pine away with great pain and the black blood drawn from the spleen and diffused under the ribs on the left side makes those perilous hypochondriacal convulsions which happen to them that are troubled with sorrow subsection five fear a cause cousin german to sorrow is fear or rather a sister fetus acutus and continual companion an assistant and a principal agent in procuring of this mischief a cause and symptom as the other in a word as virgil of the harpies i may justly say of them both tristius haud illis monstrum nec saevior ula pestis et iridaeum stygius sese extulit undus a sadder monster or more cruel plague so fell or vengeance of the gods ne'er came from styx or hell this foul fiend of fear was worshipped heretofore as a god by the lacedaemonians and most of those other torturing affections and so was sorrow amongst the rest under the name of angorona dea they stood in such awe of them as augustine de civitate de book four chapter eight noteth out of varro fear was commonly adored and painted in their temples with a lion's head and as macrobius records book ten saturnalium in the calends of january angerona had her holy day to whom in the temple of volupia or goddess of pleasure their augurs and bishops did yearly sacrifice that being propitious to them she might expel all cares anguish and vexation of the mind for that year following many lamentable effects this fear causeth in men as to be red pale tremble sweat it makes sudden cold and heat come over all the body palpitation of the heart syncope etc it amazeth many men that are to speak or show themselves in public assemblies or before some great personages as tully confessed of himself that he trembled still at the beginning of his speech and demosthenes that great orator of greece before philippus it confounds voice and memory as lucian wittily brings in jupiter tragedus so much afraid of his auditory when he was to make a speech to the rest of the gods that he could not utter a ready word but was compelled to use mercury's help in prompting many men are so amazed and astonished with fear they know not where they are what they say what they do and that which is worst it tortures them many days before with continual affrights and suspicion it hinders most honourable attempts and makes their hearts ache sad and heavy they that live in fear are never free resolute secure never merry but in continual pain that as vivus truly said nulla est miseria maior quam matus no greater misery no rack nor torture like unto it ever suspicious anxious solicitous they are childishly drooping without reason without judgment especially if some terrible object be offered as plutarch hath it it causeth oftentimes sudden madness and almost all manner of diseases as i have sufficiently illustrated in my digression of the force of imagination and shall do more at large in my section of terrors fear makes our imagination conceive what it list invites the devil to come to us as agrippa and cardan avouch and tyranniseth over our fantasy more than all other affections especially in the dark 
we see this verified in most men as lavater saith quae metuunt fingunt what they fear they conceive and feign unto themselves they think they see goblins hags devils and many times become melancholy thereby cardan subtilitate libri eighteen hath an example of such an one so caused to be melancholy by sight of a bugbear all his life after augustus caesar durst not sit in the dark nisi aliquo accidente saith suetonius nunquam tenebris exigilavit and tis strange what women and children will conceive unto themselves if they go over a churchyard in the night lie or be alone in a dark room how they sweat and tremble on a sudden many men are troubled with future events foreknowledge of their fortunes destinies as severus the emperor adrian and domitian quod scirit ultimum vitae diem saith suetonius valde solicitus much tortured in mind because he foreknew his end with many such of which i shall speak more opportunely in another place anxiety mercy pity indignation etc and such fearful branches derived from these two stems of fear and sorrow i voluntarily omit read more of them in carolus pascalius dandinus etc subsection six shame and disgrace causes shame and disgrace cause most violent passions and bitter pangs o pudorum et dedicus publicum ob errorum commissum saepe moventur generosi animi felix plater book three de alienatione mentis generous minds are often moved with shame to despair for some public disgrace and he saith philo book two de providentia de that subjects himself to fear grief ambition shame is not happy but altogether miserable tortured with continual labour care and misery it is as forcible a batterer as any of the rest many men neglect the tumults of the world and care not for glory and yet they are afraid of infamy repulse disgrace cicero de officius book one they can severely contemn pleasure bear grief indifferently but they are quite battered and broken with reproach and obloquy sequidum vita et fama paripassu ambulant and are so dejected many times for some public injury disgrace as a box on the ear by their inferior to be overcome of their adversary foiled in the field to be out in a speech some foul fact committed or disclosed etc that they dare not come abroad all their lives after but melancholize in corners and keep in holes the most generous spirits are most subject to it spiritus altos frangit et generosos hieronymus aristotle because he could not understand the motion of europus for grief and shame drowned himself caelius rodigamus antiquae lectionis book twenty nine chapter eight homerus pudore consumptus was swallowed up with this passion of shame because he could not unfold the fisherman's riddle sophocles killed himself for that a tragedy of his was hissed off the stage valerius maximus book nine chapter twelve lucretia stabbed herself and so did cleopatra when she saw that she was reserved for a triumph to avoid the infamy antonius the roman after he was overcome of his enemy for three days space sat solitary in the forepart of the ship abstaining from all company even of cleopatra herself and afterwards for very shame butchered himself plutarch vita eos apollonius rhodius wilfully banished himself forsaking his country and all his dear friends because he was out in reciting his poems plinius book seven chapter twenty three ajax ran mad because his arms were adjudged to ulysses in china tis an ordinary thing for such as are excluded in those famous trials of theirs or should take the grees for shame and grief to lose their wits Matthaeus Riccius, De Christiana Expeditione Apucinus, 
Book three, chapter nine. Hostratus the friar took that book which Reuclin had writ against him under the name of Epistula Obscurorum Virorum so to heart that for shame and grief he made away with himself, Jovius in Elogius. A grave and learned minister and an ordinary preacher at Alkmaar in Holland was one day as he walked in the fields for his recreation suddenly taken with a wax or looseness and thereupon compelled to retire to the next ditch but being surprised at unawares by some gentlewomen of his parish wandering that way was so abashed that he did never after show his head in public or come into the pulpit but pined away with melancholy Petrus Forestus, Medicae Observationis, Book Ten, Observatio Twelve. So shame, amongst other passions, can play his prize. I know there be many base, impudent, brazen-faced rogues that will nulla palascere culpa, be moved with nothing, take no infamy or disgrace to heart, laugh at all, let them be proved perjured, stigmatized convict rogues thieves traitors lose their ears be whipped branded carted pointed at hissed reviled and derided with balio the bawd in plautus they rejoice at it cantores provos babe and bombax what care they we have too many such in our times exclamat melicerta parisa frontum de rebus yet a modest man one that hath grace a generous spirit tender of his reputation will be deeply wounded and so grievously affected with it that he had rather give myriads of crowns lose his life than suffer the least defamation of honour or blot in his good name and if so be that he cannot avoid it as a nightingale que cantando victa moritor saith mesaldus dies for shame if another bird sing better he languisheth and pineth away in the anguish of his spirit end of section thirty two section thirty three of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton, Section 33. Partition 1, Section 2, Member 3, Subsections 7 to 9. Subsection 7. Envy, Malice, Hatred, Causes. Envy and Malice are two links of this chain, and both, as Guanerius Tractatus 15, Chapter 2, proves out of galen three aphorism cause this malady by themselves especially if their bodies be otherwise disposed to melancholy tis valescus de taranta and felix platerus's observation envy so gnaws many men's hearts that they become altogether melancholy and therefore belike solomon proverbs fourteen thirteen calls it the rotting of the bones cyprian vulnus occultum siculi non in venere tyranni maius tormentum the sicilian tyrants never invented the like torment it crucifies their souls withers their bodies makes them hollowed-eyed pale lean and ghastly to behold cyprian sermo tu de zelo et livore as a moth gnaws a garment so says chrysostom doth envy consume a man to be a living anatomy a skeleton to be a lean and pale carcass quickened with a fiend for so often as an envious wretch sees another man prosper to be enriched to thrive and be fortunate in the world to get honours offices or the like he repines and grieves intabescitque videndo successus ominum suppliciumque suum est he tortures himself if his equal friend neighbour be preferred commended do well if he understands of it it galls him afresh and no greater pain can come to him than to hear of another man's well-doing 
tis a dagger at his heart every such object he looks at him as they that fell down in lucian's rock of honour with an envious eye and will damage himself to do another a mischief atque cadet subitu dum super hos decadat as he did in aesop lose one eye willingly that his fellow might lose both or that rich man in quintilian that poisoned the flowers in his garden because his neighbour's bees should get no more honey from them his whole life is sorrow and every word he speaks is satire nothing fats him but other men's ruins for to speak in a word envy is not else but tristia de bonis alienis sorrow for other men's good be it present past or to come et gaudium de adversis and joy at their harms opposite to mercy which grieves at other men's mischances and misaffects the body in another kind so damasian defines it book two de orthodoxa fide thomas aquinas two point two question thirty six part one aristotle book two rhetorics chapter four and ten plato cicero three tusculans gregorius nicenus liber de virtutibus anime chapter twelve basil de envidia pindaros ode one and we find it true tis a common disease and almost natural to us as tacitus holds to envy another man's prosperity and tis in most men an incurable disease i have read saith marcus aurelius greek hebrew chaldee authors i have consulted with many wise men for a remedy for envy i could find but none but to renounce all happiness and to be a wretch and miserable for ever tis the beginning of hell in this life and a passion not to be excused every other sin hath some pleasure annexed to it or will admit of an excuse envy alone wants both other sins last but for a while the gut may be satisfied anger remits hatred hath an end envy never ceaseth cardin book to de sapientia divine and humane examples are very familiar you may run and read them as that of Saul and David, Cain and Abel, Angebat illum non proprium peccatum, set fratris prosperitas, saith Theodoret. It was his brother's good fortune galled him. Rachel envied her sister being barren, Genesis 30. Joseph's brethren him, Genesis 37. David had a touch of this vice, as he confesseth, psalms thirty seven jeremy and habukuk they repined at others good but in the end they corrected themselves psalm seventy five fret not thyself etc domitian spite agricola for his worth that a private man should be so much glorified cecina was envied of his fellow-citizens because he was more richly adorned but of all others women are most weak Ob pulcritudinem invidiae sunt femine museus aut amat aut odit nihil est tertium granatensis they love or hate no medium amongst them implacabiles plerumque lesse mulieres agrippina like a woman if she sees her neighbour more neat or elegant richer in tires jewels or apparel is enraged and like a lioness sets upon her husband rails at her scoffs at her and cannot abide her so the roman ladies and tacitus did at salonina tecina's wife because she had a better horse and better furniture as if she had hurt them with it they were much offended in like sort our gentlewomen do at their usual meetings one repines or scoffs at another's bravery and happiness mircine an attic wench was murdered of her fellows because she did excel the rest in beauty constantine caesar de agricultura book eleven chapter seven every village will yield such examples subsection eight emulation hatred faction desire of revenge causes out of this root of envy spring those feral branches of faction hatred liver emulation which cause the like grievances and are seria anime 
the saws of the soul, constellationis pleni affectus, affections full of desperate amazement, or, as Cyprian describes emulation, it is a moth of the soul, a consumption, to make another man's happiness his misery, to torture, crucify, and execute himself to eat his own heart. Meat and drink can do such men no good. They do always grieve, sigh, and groan, day and night without intermission. Their breast is torn asunder, and a little after, whomsoever he is, whom thou dost emulate and envy, he may avoid thee, but thou canst neither avoid him nor thyself. Wheresoever thou art, he is with thee. Thine enemy is ever in thy breast. Thy destruction is within thee. Thou art a captive, bound hand and foot, as long as thou art malicious and envious, and canst not be comforted. It was the devil's overthrow, and whensoever thou art thoroughly affected with this passion, it will be thine. Yet no perturbation so frequent, no passion so common. Kai kerameus keramei kotei kai tectoni tecton, kai tochos tocho ptonei kai aoidos aoido. A potter emulates a potter, one smith envies another, a beggar emulates a beggar, a singing man his brother. Every society, corporation, and private family is full of it. It takes hold almost of all sorts of men, from the prince to the ploughman, even amongst gossips it is to be seen, scarce three in a company, but there is siding, faction, emulation between two of them, some simultas, jar, private grudge, heart-burning in the midst of them. Scarce two gentlemen dwell together in the country, if they be not near kin or linked in marriage, but there is emulation betwixt them and their servants, some quarrel or some grudge betwixt their wives or children, friends and followers, some contention about wealth, gentry, precedency, etc., by means of which, like the frog in Aesop, that would swell till she was as big as an ox, burst herself at last." They will stretch beyond their fortunes, callings, and strive so long that they consume their substance in lawsuits, or otherwise in hospitality, feasting, fine clothes, to get a few bombas titles, for ambitiosa paupertate laboramus omnes, to outbrave one another, they will tire their bodies, macerate their souls, and through contentions or mutual invitations, beggar themselves." Scarce two great scholars in an age, but with bitter invectives they fall foul one on the other, and their adherents, Scotists, Thomists, Reals, Nominals, Plato and Aristotle, Galenists and Paracelsians, etc. It holds in all professions. Honest emulation in studies and all callings is not to be disliked. Tis ingeniorum cause, as one calls it, the whetstone of wit, the nurse of wit and valor, and those noble Romans out of the spirit did brave exploits. There is a modest ambition, as Themistocles was roused up with the glory of Miltiades. Achilles' trophies moved Alexander. Ambire semper stulta confidentia est, ambire nunquam deses arrogantia est, Tis a sluggish humor not to emulate, or to sue at all, to withdraw himself, neglect, refrain from such places, honors, offices, through sloth, niggardliness, fear, bashfulness, or otherwise, to which by his birth, place, fortunes, education, he is called, apt, fit, and well able to undergo. But when it is immoderate, it is a plague and a miserable pain. What a deal of money did Henry the Eighth and Francis the First, King of France, spend at that famous interview? And how many vain courtiers, seeking each to outbrave others, spent themselves their livelihood and fortunes and died beggars? Adrian the Emperor was so galled with it that he killed all his equals. So did Nero. This passion made Dionysus the tyrant banish Plato and Philoxenus the poet, because they did excel and eclipse his glory as he thought. The Romans exiled Coriolanus, confined Camillus, murdered Scipio. 
the Greeks by ostracism to expel Aristides, Nicias, Alcibiades, and Prisintesius, make away Phocian, etc. When Richard I and Philip of France were fellow soldiers together, at the siege of Aachen in the Holy Land, and Richard had approved himself to be the more valiant man, insomuch that all men's eyes were upon him. It so galled Philip, Francum urebat regis victoria, saith mine author, tam egre ferebat Ricardi gloriam ut carpere dicta culminari facta, that he cavilled at all his proceedings, and fell at length to open defiance. He could contain no longer, but hasting home, invaded his territories and professed open war. Hatred stirs up contention, Proverbs 10th, 12th, and they break out at last into immortal enmity, into virulency, and more than Vatinian hate and rage. They persecute each other, their friends, followers, and all their prosperity with bitter taunts, hostile wars, scurled inventives libels calumnies fire sword and the like and will not be reconciled witness that guelph and ghibelline faction in italy that of the adurni and fregosi in genoa that of cneus papirius and quintus fabius in rome caesar and pompey orleans and burgundy in france york and lancaster in england yea this passion so rageth many times that it subverts not men only and families but even populous cities carthage and corinth can witness as much nay flourishing kingdoms are brought into a wilderness by it this hatred malice faction and desire of revenge invented first all those racks and wheels strapidos brazen bulls feral engines prisons inquisitions severe laws to macerate and torment one another how happy might we be and end our time with blessed days and sweet content if we could contain ourselves and as we ought to do put up injuries learn humility meekness patience forget and forgive as in god's word we are enjoined compose such final controversies amongst ourselves moderate our passions in this kind and think better of others as paul would have us than of ourselves be of like affection one towards another and not avenge ourselves but have peace with all men but being that we are so peevish and perverse insolent and proud so factious and seditious so malicious and envious we do in vincem angariare maul and vex one another torture disquiet and precipitate ourselves into that gulf of woes and cares aggravate our misery and melancholy heap upon us hell and eternal damnation subsection nine anger a cause anger a perturbation which carries the spirit outwards preparing the body to melancholy and madness itself ira furor brevis est anger is temporary madness and as piccolomineus accounts it one of the three most violent passions aretius sets it down for an especial cause so doth seneca epistles eighteen one of this malady maninus gives the reason ex frequenti ira supra modum calefiunt it overheats their bodies and if it be too frequent it breaks out into manifest madness saith st ambrose tis a known saying furor fit iaesa sepius patientia the most patient spirit that is if he be often provoked will be incensed to madness it will make a devil of a saint and therefore basil belike in his homily de ira calls it tenebras rationis morbum anime et demonem pessimum the darkening of our understanding and a bad angel lucian in abdicto tome one will have this passion to work this effect especially in old men and women anger and calumny saith he trouble them at first and after a while break out into madness many things cause fury in women especially if they love or hate overmuch or envy be much grieved or angry 
these things by little and little lead them on to this malady from a disposition they proceed to a habit for there is no difference between a mad man and an angry man in the time of his fit anger as lactantius describes it liber de ira dei ad donatum chapter five is servia animi tempestas etc a cruel tempest of the mind making his eyes sparkle fire and stare teeth gnash in his head his tongue stutter his face pale or red and what more filthy imitation can be of a mad man ora tument ira fervescunt sanguine venae lumina gorgonio sevius angue micant they are void of reason inexorable blind like beasts and monsters for the time say and do they know not what curse swear rail fight and what not how can a madman do more as he said in the comedy iracundia non sum apud me i am not mine own man if these fits be immoderate continue long or be frequent without doubt they provoke madness montanus had a melancholy jew to his patient he ascribes this for a principal cause eras shevatur levibus de causis he was easily moved to anger ajax had no other beginning of his madness and charles the sixth that lunatic french king fell into this misery out of the extremity of his passion desire of revenge and malice incensed against the duke of britain he could neither eat drink nor sleep for some days together and in the end about the calends of july thirteen ninety two he became mad upon his horseback drawing his sword striking such as came near him promiscuously and so continued all the days of his life Aegisipus, Historia de Exidio Urbis Hierosolimitaniae, Book One, Chapter Thirty Seven, hath such a story of Herod that out of an angry fit became mad, leaping out of his bed, he killed Josippus and played many such bedlam pranks. The whole court could not rule him for a long time after. Sometimes he was sorry and repented much grief for that he had done post quam de ferbuit ira by and by outrageous again in hot choleric bodies nothing so soon causeth madness as this passion of anger besides many other diseases as palacius observes chapter twenty one book one de humorum affectionum causis sanguinem immunit fel auget and as valesius controverts controversiarium medicarum et philosophicarum book five controversia eight many times kills them quite out if this were the worst of this passion it were more tolerable but it ruins and subverts whole towns cities families and kingdoms nulla pestis humano generi pluris stetit saith seneca de ira book one no plague hath done mankind so much harm look into our histories and you shall almost meet with no other subject but what a company of harebrains have done in their rage we may do well therefore to put this in our procession amongst the rest from all blindness of heart from pride vainglory and hypocrisy from envy hatred and malice anger and all such pestiferous perturbations good lord deliver us end of section thirty three section thirty four of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 34. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 3, Subsection 10. Discontents, cares, miseries, etc. Causes. Discontents, cares, crosses, 
miseries, or whatsoever it is, that shall cause any molestation of spirits, grief, anguish, and perplexity, may well be reduced to this head, preposterously placed here in some men's judgments, they may seem. Yet, in that Aristotle in his rhetoric defines these cares, as he doth envy, emulation, etc., still by grief, I think I may well rank them in this irascible row, being that they are as the rest, both causes and symptoms of this disease, producing the like inconveniences, and are most part accompanied with anguish and pain. The common etymology will evince it. Cura quasi cor ur, dementes curae, insomnes curae, damnosae curae, tristes, mordaces, carnifices, etc., biting, eating, gnawing, cruel, bitter, sick, sad, unquiet, pale, tetric, miserable, intolerable cares, as the poets call them, worldly cares, and are as many in number as the sea sands. Galen, Fernelius, Felix Plata, Valescus de Taranta, etc., reckon afflictions, miseries, even all these contentions, and vexations of the mind, as principal causes, in that they take away sleep, hinder concoction, dry up the body, and consume the substance of it. They are not so many in number, but their causes be as diverse, and not one of a thousand free from them, or that can vindicate himself, whom that, Ate Dea, per hominum capita molitor ambulans, plantas pedum teneris habens, over men's heads walking aloft, with tender feet treading so soft. Homer's goddess Arte hath not involved into this discontented rank, or plagued with some misery or other. Hyginus, Fabulae 220, to this purpose hath a pleasant tale. Dame Cura by chance went over a brook, and taking up some of the dirty slime, made an image of it. Jupiter eftsoons coming by, put life to it. But Cura and Jupiter could not agree what name to give him, or who should own him. The matter was referred to Saturn as judge. He gave this arbitrament. His name shall be Homo ab Humo. Cura eum possidiat quam Dio vivat. Care shall have him whilst he lives, Jupiter his soul, and Tellus his body when he dies. But to leave tales. A general cause, a continuate cause, an inseparable accident. To all men is discontent, care, misery. Were there no other particular affliction, which who is free from, to molest a man in this life, the very cogitation of that common misery were enough to macerate and make him weary of his life, to think that he can never be secure, but still in danger, sorrow, grief, and persecution. For to begin at the hour of his birth, as Pliny doth elegantly describe it, he is born naked and falls a whining at the very first. He is swaddled and bound up like a prisoner, cannot help himself, and so he continues to his life's end. Cujusque ferae pabulum, saith Seneca, impatient of heat and cold, impatient of labour, impatient of idleness, exposed to fortune's contumely. To a naked mariner Lucretius compares him, cast on shore by shipwreck, cold and comfortless in an unknown land. No estate, age, sex can secure himself from this common misery. A man that is born of a woman is of short continuance and full of trouble. Job 14, 1, 22. And while his flesh is upon him, he shall be sorrowful. And while his soul is in him, it shall mourn. All his days are sorrow and his travels griefs. His heart also taketh not rest in the night. Ecclesiastes 2, 23 and 2, 11. All that is in it is sorrow and vexation of spirit. Ingress, progress, regress, egress, much alike. Blindness seizes on us all in the beginning, labour in the middle, grief in the end, error in all. What day ariseth to us without some grief, care, or anguish? Or what so secure and pleasing a morning have we seen that hath not been overcast before the evening? One is miserable, another ridiculous, a third odious. One complains of this grievance, another of that. Aliquando nervi, aliquando pedes vexant, Seneca, nunc distillatio, nunc epatis morbus, 
nunc dies, nunc superest sanguis, now the headaches, then the feet, now the lungs, then the liver, etc. Quic sensus exuberat, sed est pudori de gener sanguis, etc. He is rich, but base-born. He is noble, but poor. A third hath means, but he wants health, peradventure, or wit to manage his estate. Children vex one, wife a second, etc. Nemo facile cam conditione sua concordat. No man is pleased with his fortune. A pound of sorrow is familiarly mixed with a dram of content, little or no joy, little comfort, but everywhere danger, contention, anxiety. In all places, go where thou wilt, and thou shalt find discontent, cares, woes, complaints, sickness, diseases, encumbrances, exclamations. If thou look into the market, there, says Chrysostom, is brawling and contention, if to the court, there knavery and flattery, etc., if to a private man's house, there's cark and care, heaviness, etc. As he said of old, Nil homine in terra spirit misera magis alma. No creature so miserable as man, so generally molested, in miseries of body, in miseries of mind, miseries of heart, in miseries asleep, in miseries awake, in miseries wheresoever he turns, as Bernard found. Nun quid tentatio est vita humana super terram, a mere temptation is our life, Augustine Confessions, Book 10, Chapter 28. Catena perpetuorum, malorum, et quis potest molestias et difficultates parti. Who can endure the miseries of it? In prosperity we are insolent and intolerable, dejected in adversity, in all fortunes foolish and miserable. In adversity I wish for prosperity, and in prosperity I am afraid of adversity. What mediocrity may be found? Where is no temptation? What condition of life is free? Wisdom hath labour annexed to it, glory, envy, riches and cares, children and encumbrances, pleasure and diseases, rest and beggary go together, as if a man were therefore born, as the Platonists hold, to be punished in this life for some precedent sins. Or that, as Pliny complains, nature may be rather accounted a stepmother than a mother to us, all things considered, no creature's life so brittle, so full of fear, so mad, so furious. Only man is plagued with envy, discontent, griefs, covetousness, ambition, superstition. Our whole life is an Irish sea, wherein there is naught to be expected but tempestuous storms and troublesome waves, and those infinite. Tantum malorum pelagus aspicio, ut non sit inde in a tandi copia. No halcyonian times, wherein a man can hold himself secure, or agree with his present estate, but as Boethius infers, there is something in every one of us which before trial we seek, and having tried, abhor. We earnestly wish, and eagerly covet, and are as soon weary of it. Thus between hope and fear, suspicions, angers, inter spemque matumque, timores inter et iras, betwixt falling in, falling out, etc., we bangle away our best days, be fool out our times. We lead a contentious, discontent, tumultuous, melancholy, miserable life. Insomuch that if we could foretell what was to come, and put to our choice, we should rather refuse than accept of this painful life. In a word, the world itself is a maze, a labyrinth of errors, a desert, a wilderness, a den of thieves, cheaters, etc. Full of filthy puddles, horrid rocks, precipitiums, an ocean of adversity, an heavy yoke, wherein infirmities and calamities overtake and follow one another as the sea waves, and if we scape Scylla, we fall foul of Charybdis, and so in perpetual fear, labour, anguish, we run from one plague, one mischief, one burden to another. Duram servientis servitutem, and you may as soon separate weight from lead, heat from fire, moistness from water, brightness from the sun, as misery, discontent, care, calamity, danger from a man. Our towns and cities are but so many dwellings of human misery, in which grief and sorrow, as he right well observes out of Solon, innumerable troubles, labours of mortal men, and all manner of vices are included as in so many pens. Our villages are like molehills, and men as so many emmets, busy, busy still, going to and fro, in and out, and crossing one another's projects as the lines of several sea-cards cut each other in a global map. 
now light and merry, but, as one follows it, by and by sorrowful and heavy, now hoping, then distrusting, now patient, tomorrow crying out, now pale, then red, running, sitting, sweating, trembling, halting, etc. Some few amongst the rest, or perhaps one of a thousand, may be Pullus Jovis in the world's esteem, Galenae Filius Albi, an happy and fortunate man, ad invidium Felix, because rich, fair, well allied in honour and office. Yet peradventure ask himself, and he will say, that of all others he is most miserable and unhappy. A fair shoe, hic socus novus elegans, as he said, sed nescus ubi urat, but thou knowest not where it pincheth. It is not another man's opinion can make me happy, but as Seneca will have it. He is a miserable wretch that doth not account himself happy, though he be sovereign lord of a world. He is not happy if he think himself not to be so. For what availeth it, what thine estate is, or seem to others, if thou thyself dislike it? A common humour it is of all men to think well of other men's fortunes, and dislike their own. Qui placet alterius, sue nimirum est odio sors, but, qui fit meconius, etc., how comes it to pass? What's the cause of it? Many men are of such a perverse nature, they are well pleased with nothing, saith Theodoret, neither with riches nor poverty. They complain when they are well and when they are sick, grumble at all fortunes, prosperity and adversity. They are troubled in a cheap year, in a barren, plenty or not plenty, nothing pleaseth them, war nor peace, with children nor with that. This, for the most part, is the humour of us all to be discontent, miserable, and most unhappy, as we think at least, and show me him that is not so, or that ever was otherwise. Quintus Metellus, his felicity, is infinitely admired among the Romans, insomuch that as Paterculus mentioneth of him, you can scarce find of any nation, order, age, sex, one for happiness to be compared unto him. He had, in a word, bona animi, corporis et fortunae, goods of mind, body, and fortune, so had P. Mutianus, Crassus. Lampsaca, that Lacedaemonian lady, was such another in Pliny's conceit. A king's wife, a king's mother, a king's daughter, and all the world esteemed as much of Polycrates of Samos. The Greeks brag of their Socrates, Phocion, Aristides, the Sophidians in particular of their Aglaeus, Omni Vita Felix, Ab Omni Periculo Immunis, which by the way Pausanias held impossible the Romans of their Cato, Curius, Fabricius, for their composed fortunes and retired estates, government of passions and contempt of the world. Yet none of all these were happy or free from discontent, neither Metellus, Crassus, nor Polycrates, for he died a violent death, and so did Cato. And how much evil doth Lactantius and Theodoret speak of Socrates, a weak man, and so of the rest? There is no content in this life, but as he said, all is vanity and vexation of spirit, lame and imperfect. Hadst thou Samson's hair, Milo's strength, Scanderberg's arm, Solomon's wisdom, Absalom's beauty, Croesus's wealth, Persatus' obulum, Caesar's valour, Alexander's spirit, Tully or Demosthenes' eloquence, Gyges' ring, Perseus's pegasus, and Gorgon's head, Nestor's years to come, all this world would not make thee absolute give thee content, and true happiness in this life, or so continue it. Even in the midst of all our mirth, jollity, and laughter, is sorrow and grief, or if there be true happiness amongst us, it is but for a time. Desinat in piscem mulia formosa supeme, a handsome woman with a fish's tail. A fair morning turns to a lowering afternoon. Brutus and Cassius, once renowned, both eminently happy, Yet you shall scarce find two, saith Paterculus, quos fortuna martorius destiturit, whom fortune sooner forsook. Hannibal, a conqueror all his life, met with his match, and was subdued at last. Of curit forti, qui mage fortis erit. One is brought in triumph, as Caesar into Rome, Alcibiades into Athens, Coronus Aureus Donatus, crowned, honoured, admired. By and by his statues demolished, he hissed out, massacred, etc. Magnus Gonsalva, that famous Spaniard, was of the prince and people at first honoured, approved, forthwith confined and banished. 
admirandus actiones, graves plerunque sequuntur invidiae, et aques calumniae. Tis Polybius his observation, grievous enemies and bitter calumnies commonly follow renowned actions. One is born rich, dies a beggar, sound today, sick tomorrow. Now in most flourishing estate, fortunate and happy. By and by deprived of his goods by foreign enemies, robbed by thieves, spoiled, captivated, impoverished, as they of rubber put under iron saws, and under iron harrows, and under axes of iron, and cast into the tile kiln. Quid me felicem toties dactastis amici, qui cecidit, stabili non erat ille gradu. He that erst marched like Xerxes with innumerable armies, as rich as Croesus, now shifts for himself in a poor cockboat, is bound in iron chains with Bajazet the Turk, and a footstool with Aurelian, for a tyrannizing conqueror to trample on. So many casualties there are, that as Seneca said of a city consumed with fire, una dies interest inter maximum civitatum et nullam. One day betwixt a great city and none, so many grievances from outward accidents and from ourselves, our own indiscretion, inordinate appetite, one day betwixt a man and no man, and which is worse, as if discontents and miseries would not come fast enough upon us, homo homini daemon. We maul, persecute, and study how to sting, gall, and vex one another with mutual hatred, abuses, injuries, preying upon and devouring as so many ravenous birds, and as jugglers, pandas, boards, cozening one another, or raging as wolves, tigers, and devils, we take a delight to torment one another. Men are evil, wicked, malicious, treacherous, and naught, not loving one another or loving themselves, not hospitable, charitable, nor sociable as they ought to be, but counterfeit, dissemblers, ambidexters, all for their own ends, hard-hearted, merciless, pitiless, and to benefit themselves, they care not what mischief they procure to others. Praxinoe and Gorgo in the poet, when they had got in to see those costly sights, they then cried, Bene est, and would thrust out all the rest. When they are rich themselves, in honour preferred, full, and have even that they would, they debar others of those pleasures which youth requires, and they formerly have enjoyed. He sits at table in a soft chair at ease, but he doth remember in the meantime that a tired waiter stands behind him, and hungry fellow ministers to him full. He is a thirst that gives him drink, saith Epictetus and is silent whilst he speaks his pleasure, pensive, sad, when he laughs. Pleno se proluit auro. He feasts, revels, and profusely spends, hath variety of robes, sweet music, ease, and all the pleasure the world can afford, whilst many an hunger-starved poor creature pines in the street, wants clothes to cover him, labours hard all day long, runs, rides for a trifle, fights peradventure from sun to sun, sick and ill, weary, full of pain and grief is in great distress and sorrow of heart. He loathes and scorns his inferior, hates or emulates his equal, envies his superior, insults over all such as are under him, as if he were of another species, a demigod, not subject to any fall or human infirmities. Generally they love not, are not beloved again. They tire out others' bodies with continual labour, they themselves living at ease, caring for none else, sibi nati, and are so far many times from putting to their helping hand, that they seek all means to depress, even most worthy and well-deserving, better than themselves, those whom they are by the laws of nature bound to relieve and help. As much as in them lies, they will let them cut a wall, starve, beg, and hang, before they will anyways, though it be in their power, assist or ease. So unnatural are they for the most part, so unregardful, so hard-hearted, so churlish, proud, insolent so dogged, of so bad a disposition, and being so brutish, so devilishly bent one towards another, how is it possible that we should be discontent of all sides, full of cares, woes, and miseries? If this be not a sufficient proof of their discontent and misery, examine every condition and calling apart. Kings, princes, monarchs, and magistrates seem to be most happy, but look into their estate, you shall find them to be most encumbered with cares, in perpetual fear, agony, suspicion, jealousy, that, as he said of a crown, if they knew but the discontents that accompany it, 
they would not stoop to take it up. Quem mihi regent davis, saith Chrysostom, non curis plenum. What king canst thou show me not full of cares? Look not on his crown, but consider his afflictions. Attend not his number of servants, but multitude of crosses. Nihil aliud potestas columnis, quam tempestas mentis, as Gregory seconds him. Sovereignty is a tempest of the soul. Scylla like they have brave titles, but terrible fits. Splendorum titulo, cruciatum animo, which made Demosthenes vow, si vel ad tribuno, vel ad interitum duceretur. If to be a judge or to be condemned were put to his choice, he would be condemned. Rich men are in the same predicament. What their pains are, stulti nesciunt, ipsi sentient. They feel, fools perceive not. As I shall prove elsewhere, and their wealth is brittle, like children's rattles. They come and go, there is no certainty in them. Those whom they elevate, they do as suddenly depress, and leave in a veil of misery. The middle sort of men are as so many asses to bear burdens, or if they be free and live at ease, they spend themselves and consume their bodies and fortunes with luxury and riot, contention, emulation, etc. The poor I reserve for another place, and their discontents. For particular professions I hold as of the rest, there's no content or security in any. On what course will you pitch? How resolve? To be a divine, tis contemptible in the world's esteem. To be a lawyer, tis to be a wrangler. To be a physician, prudet lotii, tis loathed. A philosopher, a madman, an alchemist, a beggar. A poet, esuit, an hungry jack a musician, a player, a schoolmaster, a drudge, an husbandman, an emmet, a merchant, his gains are uncertain, a mechanician, base, a chirurgeon, fulsome, a tradesman, a liar, a tailor, a thief, a serving man, a slave, a soldier, a butcher, a smith, or a metalman, the pot's never from his nose, a courtier, a parasite, as he could find no tree in the wood to hang himself, I can show no state of life to give content, the like you may say of all ages. Children live in perpetual slavery, still under that tyrannical government of masters, young men and of riper years, subject to labour and a thousand cares of the world, to treachery, falsehood and cosmage. Incedit per ignes, suppositos cineri doloso. You incautious tread on fires, with faithless ashes overhead. Old are full of aches in their bones, cramps and convulsions. Silicernia, dull of hearing, weak-sighted, hoary, wrinkled, harsh, so much altered as that they cannot know their own face in a glass, a burthen to themselves and others. After seventy years all is sorrow, as David hath it. They do not live, but linger. If they be sound, they fear diseases, if sick, weary of their lives. Non est vivere, sed valere vita. One complains of want, a second of servitude, another of a secret or incurable disease, of some deformity of body, of some loss, danger, death of friends, shipwreck, persecution, imprisonment, disgrace, repulse, contumely, calumny, abuse, injury, contempt, ingratitude, unkindness, scoffs, flouts, unfortunate marriage, single life, too many children, no children, false servants, unhappy children, barrenness, banishment, oppression, prostrate hopes and ill success, etc. Talia de genere hoc adio sunt multa, loquacum ut delassare valent fabium. But every various instance to repeat would tire even Fabius of incessant prate. Talking Fabius will be tired before he can tell half of them. They are the subject of whole volumes and shall, some of them, be more opportunely dilated elsewhere. In the meantime, thus much I say of them, that generally they crucify the soul of man, attenuate our bodies, dry them, wither them, shrivel them up like old apples, make them as so many anatomies, ossa atque pellis est totus, ita curis macet. They cause tempus fidem et squalidum, cumbersome days, ingrataque tempora, slow, dull and heavy times, make us howl, roar and tear our hairs, as sorrow did in Kibi's tale, 
and groan for the very anguish of our souls. Our hearts fail us, as David's did, Psalm 40, 12, for innumerable troubles that compassed him, and we are ready to confess with Hezekiah, Isaiah 58, 17. Behold, for felicity I had bitter grief, to weep with Heraclitus, to curse the day of our birth with Jeremy, 20, 14, and our stars with Job, to hold that axiom of Salenus, better never to have been born, and the best next of all to die quickly, or if we must live, to abandon the world as Timon did, creep into caves and holes as our anchorites, cast all into the sea as Crates Thebanus, or as Theombrotus and Rocciato's four hundred auditors, precipitate ourselves to be rid of these miseries. End of section 34《ヴァイオレット・メランコリー》Vol.1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion.《ヴァイオレット・メランコリー》Vol.1 by Robert Burton, Section 35. Partition 1, Section 2, Member 3, Subsections 11 to 12. Subsection 11 concupiscible appetite, as desires, ambition, causes. These concupiscible and irascible appetites are as the two twists of a rope, mutually mixed one with the other, and both twining about the heart. Both good, as Augustine holds, Book 14, Chapter 9, De Civitate Dei, if they be moderate, both pernicious if they be exorbitant. This concupiscible appetite, howsoever, it may seem to carry with it a show of pleasure and delight, and our concupiscences most part affect us with content and a pleasing object. Yet if they be in extremes, they rack and wring us on the other side. A true saying it is, desire hath no rest, is infinite in itself, endless, and as one calls it, a perpetual rack, or horse-mill, according to Augustine, still going round as in a ring. They are not so continual as diverse, Felicius atomos de numerare possum, saith Bernard, quam motis cordis, nunc haec, nunc illa cogito. You may as well reckon up the motes in the sun as them. It extends itself to everything, as Guianerius will have it, that is superfluously sought after, or to any fervent desire, as Fernelius interprets it. Be it in what kind soever, it tortures if immoderate, and is, according to Plato and others, an especial cause of melancholy. Multuosis concupiscientis delaniantur cogitationes mei, Augustine confessed, that he was torn to pieces with his manifold desires, and so doth Bernard complain, that he could not rest from them a minute of an hour. This I would have, and that, and then I desire to be such and such. Tis a hard matter, therefore, to confine them, being they are so various and many, impossible to apprehend all. I will only insist upon some few of the chief, and most noxious in their kind, as that exorbitant appetite and desire of honour, which we commonly call ambition, love of money, which is covetousness, and that greedy desire of gain, self-love, pride, and inordinate desire of vainglory or applause, love of study in excess, love of women, which will require a just volume of itself, of the other I will briefly speak, and in their order. Ambition a proud covetousness, or a dry thirst of honour, a great torture of the mind, composed of envy, pride, and covetousness, a gallant madness, one defines it a pleasant poison, Ambrose, a canker of the soul, and hidden plague, Bernard, a secret poison, the father of liver, and mother of hypocrisy, the moth of holiness, and cause of madness, crucifying and disquieting all that it takes hold of. Seneca calls it, rem solicitam, timidam, vanam, ventosum, a windy thing, a vain, solicitous, and fearful thing. For commonly they that, like Sisyphus, roll this restless stone of ambition, are in a perpetual agony, still perplexed, semper taciti, tritesque recedunt, Lucretius, doubtful, timorous, suspicious, loath to offend in word or deed, still cogging and colloguing, embracing, capping, cringing, applauding, 
flattering, fleering, visiting, waiting at men's doors with all affability, counterfeit honesty, and humility. If that will not serve, if once this humour, as Cyprian describes it, possess his thirsty soul, ambitionis salsugo ubi bibulam animam possidet, by hook and by crook he will obtain it, and from his hole he will climb to all honours and offices, if it be possible for him to get up, flattering one, bribing another, he will leave no means unassayed to win all. It is a wonder to see how slavishly these kind of men subject themselves, when they are about a suit, to every inferior person, what pains they will take, run, ride, cast, plot, countermine, protest and swear, vow, promise, what labours undergo, early up, down late, how obsequious and affable they are, how popular and courteous, how they grin and fleer upon every man they meet, with what feasting and inviting, how they spend themselves and their fortunes in seeking that many times which they had much better be without, as Cineas the orator told Pyrrhus, with what waking nights, painful hours, anxious thoughts, and bitterness of mind, interspemque metumque, distracted and tired, they consume the interim of their time. There can be no greater plague for the present. If they do obtain their suit, with which such cost and solicitude they have sought, they are not so freed, their anxiety is anew to begin, for they are never satisfied. Nihil aliud nisi imperium spirant. Their thoughts, actions, endeavours are all for sovereignty and honour. Like Louis Sforza, that huffing Duke of Milan, a man of singular wisdom but profound ambition, born to his own and to the destruction of Italy, though it be to their own ruin and friends' undoing, they will contend. They may not seize, but as a dog in a wheel, a bird in a cage, or a squirrel in a chain, so Budaeus compares them. They climb and climb still, with much labour, but never make an end, never at the top. A knight would be a baronet, and then a lord, and then a viscount, and then an earl, etc. A doctor, a dean, and then a bishop, from tribune to praetor, from bailiff to major. First this office, and then that, as Pyrrhus in Plutarch. They will first have Greece, then Africa, and then Asia, and swell with Aesop's frog so long, till in the end they burst, or come down with Sejanus, ad Germonius Gallus, and break their own necks. Or as Evangelus the piper in Lucian, that blew his pipe so long till he fell down dead. If he chanced to miss and have a canvas, he is in a hell on the other side, so dejected that he is ready to hang himself, turn heretic, Turk, or traitor in an instant. Enraged against his enemies, he rails, swears, fights, slanders, detracts, envies, murders, and for his own part, si appetitum explere non potest, furore corripitur. If he cannot satisfy his desire, as Bodine writes, he runs mad, so that both ways, hit or miss, he is distracted so long as his ambition lasts. He can look for no other but anxiety and care, discontent and grief in the meantime, madness itself or violent death in the end. The event of this is common to be seen in populous cities or in princes' courts, for a courtier's life, as Budaeus describes it, is a gallimorphy of ambition, lust, fraud, imposture, dissimulation, detraction, envy, pride. In the court, a common conventicle of flatterers, time-servers, politicians, etc., or, as Antony Perez will, the suburbs of hell itself. If you will see such discontented persons, there you shall likely find them, and which he observed of the markets of old Rome. Qui perjurum convenire vult hominum, mito in comitium, qui mendacum et gloriosum apod cluasine sacrum, dites, damnos maritos, sub basilica quirito, etc. Perjured knaves, knights of the post, liars, crackers, bad husbands, etc., keep their several stations. They do still, and always did in every commonwealth. Subsection 12. Bill Argyria, Covetousness, a Cause. Plutarch, in his book, Whether the Diseases of the Body Be More Grievous Than Those of the Soul, is of opinion. If you will examine all the causes of our miseries in this life, you shall find them most part to have had their beginning from stubborn anger, that furious desire of contention, 
or some unjust or immoderate affection, as covetousness, etc. From whence are wars and contentions amongst you? St. James asks. I will add usury, fraud, rapine, simony, oppression, lying, swearing, bearing false witness, etc. Are they not from this fountain of covetousness, that greediness in getting, tenacity in keeping, sordidity in spending, that they are so wicked, unjust against God, their neighbour, themselves, all comes hence. The desire of money is the root of all evil, and they that lust after it pierce themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 6.10 Hippocrates, therefore, in his epistle to Crateva, an herbalist, gives him this good counsel, that if it were possible, amongst other herbs, he should cut up that weed of covetousness by the roots, that there be no remainder left, and then know this for a certainty, that together with their bodies, thou mayst quickly cure all the diseases of their minds. For it is indeed the pattern, image, epitome of all melancholy, the fountain of many miseries, much discontented care and woe, this inordinate or immoderate desire of gain, to get or keep money, as Bonaventure defines it, or as Augustine describes it, a madness of the soul, Gregory, a torture, Chrysostom, an insatiable drunkenness, Cyprian, blindness, speciosum supplicium, a plague subverting kingdoms, families, an incurable disease, Budaeus, an ill habit yielding to no remedies. Neither Aesculapius nor Plutus can cure them. A continual plague, saith Solomon, and vexation of spirit. Another hell. I know there be some of opinion that covetous men are happy and worldly wise, that there is more pleasure in getting of wealth than in spending, and no delight in the world like unto it. Twas bias problem of old. With what art thou not weary with getting money? What is most delectable? To gain. What is it, trow you? that makes a poor man labour all his lifetime, carry such great burdens, fare so hardly, macerate himself, and endure so much misery, undergo such base offices with so great patience, to rise up early, and lie down late, if there were not an extraordinary delight in getting and keeping of money. What makes a merchant that hath no need, satis superque domi, to range all over the world, through all those intemperate zones of heat and cold, voluntarily to venture his life, and be content with such miserable famine, nasty usage in a stinking ship, if there were not a pleasure and hope to get money, which doth season the rest, and mitigate his indefatigable pains. What makes them go into the bowels of the earth, an hundred fathom deep, endangering their dearest lives, enduring damps and filthy smells, when they have enough already, if they could be content, and no such cause to labour, but an extraordinary delight they take in riches. This may seem plausible at first show, a popular and strong argument, but let him that so thinks consider better of it, and he shall soon perceive that it is far otherwise than he supposeth. It may be haply pleasing at the first, as most part all melancholy is, for such men likely have some lucida intervala, pleasant symptoms intermixed, but you must note that of Chrysostom. Tis one thing to be rich, another to be covetous. Generally they are all fools, dizzards, madmen, miserable wretches, living beside themselves, sine arte fuende, in perpetual slavery, fear, suspicion, sorrow, and discontent, plus allos quam melis habent, and are indeed rather possessed by their money than possessors, as Cyprian hath it, mancipati pecunius, bound prentice to their goods, as Pliny, or as Chrysostom, servi divitiarum, slaves and drudges to their substance, and we may conclude of them all, as Valerius doth of Ptolemaeus king of Cyprus, he was in title a king of that island, but in his mind a miserable drudge of money, potiore metalis, libertate carens, wanting his liberty, which is better than gold. Damasippus the Stoic, in Horace, proves that all mortal men dote by fits, some one way, some another, but that covetous men are madder than the rest, and he shall truly look into their estates, and examine their symptoms, shall find no better of them, but that they are all fools, as Nabal was. Re et nomine, 1 Regis 15, for what greater folly can there be, or madness, than to macerate himself when he need not, and when, as Cyprian notes, he may be freed from his burden, and eased of his pains will go on still, his wealth increasing, when he hath enough.
to get more, to live besides himself, to starve his genius, keep back from his wife and children, neither letting them nor other friends use or enjoy that which is theirs by right, and which they much need, perhaps. Like a hog, or dog in the manger, he doth only keep it, because it shall do nobody else good, hurting himself and others, and for a little momentary pelf, damn his own soul. They are commonly sad and tetric by nature, as Achab's spirit was, because he could not get Naboth's vineyard. 1 Regis 22 And if he lay out his money at any time, though it be to necessary uses, to his own children's good, he brawls and scolds, his heart is heavy, much disquieted he is, and loath to part from it. Misa abstinet et timet uti, Horace. He is of a wearish, dry, pale constitution, and cannot sleep for cares and worldly business. His riches, saith Solomon, will not let him sleep, and unnecessary business which he heapeth on himself, or if he do sleep, tis a very unquiet, interrupt, unpleasing sleep, with his bags in his arms. Congestis undique sac, indormit in hians. And though he be at a banquet, or at some merry feast, he sighs for grief of heart, as Cyprian hath it, and cannot sleep though it be upon a down bed. His weary body takes no rest, troubled in his abundance, and sorrowful in plenty, unhappy for the present, and more unhappy in the life to come. Basil, he is a perpetual drudge, restless in his thoughts, and never satisfied, a slave, a wretch, a dust-worm, semper quod idolo sur immolet, sedulus observat Cyprianus, prologue ad sermon, still seeking what sacrifice he may offer to his golden god, perfas et nefas. He cares not how, his trouble is endless. Crescunt divitii, tamen curtai, nescio quid semper abest re. His wealth increaseth, and the more he hath, the more he wants, like Pharaoh's lean kine, which devoured the fat, and were not satisfied. Augustine therefore defines covetousness, quarum libet rerum inhonestum et insatiabilem cupiditatum, a dishonest and insatiable desire of gain and yet in one of his epistles compares it to hell, which devours all, and yet never hath enough. A bottomless pit, an endless misery. Inquem scopulum avaritae, cadaverosi senis ut plurimum impingunt. And that which is their greatest corrosive. They are in continual suspicion, fear, and distrust. He thinks his own wife and children are so many thieves, and go about to cozen him. His servants are all false. Rem suum periisse, seque eradicariere, et divum atque hominum clamat continuo fidem, de suo tigilo si qua exit foras. If his doors creak, then out he cries anon, his goods are gone, and he is quite undone. Timidus Plutus, an old proverb, as fearful as Plutus, so doth Aristophanes and Lucian bring him in fearful still, pale, anxious, suspicious, and trusting no man. They are afraid of tempests for their corn, they are afraid of their friends, lest they should ask something of them, beg or borrow. They are afraid of their enemies, lest they hurt them, thieves, lest they rob them. They are afraid of war, and afraid of peace, afraid of rich, and afraid of poor, afraid of all. Last of all, they are afraid of want, that they shall die beggars, which makes them lay up still, and dare not use that they have. What if a dear year come, or dearth, or some loss? And were it not that they are both to lay out money on a rope, they would be hanged forthwith, and sometimes die to save charges, and make away themselves, if their corn and cattle miscarry, though they have abundance left, as Agellius notes. Valerius makes mention of one that in a famine sold a mouse for two hundred pence, and famished himself. Such are their cares, griefs, and perpetual fears. These symptoms are elegantly expressed by Theophrastus in his character of a covetous man. Lying in bed, he asked his wife whether she shut the trunks and chests fast, the cap-case be sealed, and whether the hall-door be bolted. And though she say all is well, he riseth out of his bed in his shirt, barefoot and bare-legged, to see whether it be so, with a dark lantern searching every corner, scarce sleeping a wink all night. Lucian, in that pleasant and witty dialogue called Gallus, Brings in my Silas the cobbler disputing with his cock. 
sometimes Pythagoras, where after much speech pro and con, to prove the happiness of a mean estate, and discontents of a rich man, Pythagoras cock in the end, to illustrate by examples that which he had said, brings him to Griffon the usurer's house after midnight, and after that to Encrates, whom they found both awake, casting up their accounts, and telling of their money, lean, dry, pale, and anxious, still suspecting lest somebody should make a hole through the wall, and so get in, or if a rat or mouse did but stir, starting upon a sudden, and running to the door to see whether all were fast. Plautus, in his Olularia, makes old Euclio commanding Staphila, his wife, to shut the doors fast, and the fire to be put out, lest anybody should make that an errand to come to his house. When he washed his hands, he was loath to fling away the foul water, complaining that he was undone, because the smoke got out of his roof. And as he went from home, seeing a crow scratch upon the muck-hill, returned in all haste, taking it for malum omen, an ill sign, his money was digged up, with many such. He that will but observe their actions, shall find these and many such passages not feigned for sport, but really performed, verified indeed by such covetous and miserable wretches, and that it is, manifesta fenesis, ut locuples moriaris agenti vivere fato, a mere madness to live like a wretch and die rich. End of section 35Section 36 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton. Section 36. Partition 1, Section 2. Member 3, Subsection 13. Love of gaming, etc., and pleasures immoderate. Causes. It is a wonder to see how many poor, distressed, miserable wretches one shall meet almost in every path and street, begging for an alms, that have been well descended, and sometimes in flourishing estate, now ragged, tattered, and ready to be starved, lingering out a painful life in discontent and grief of body and mind, and all through immoderate lust, gaming, pleasure, and riot. "'Tis the common end of all sensual epicures and brutish prodigals, "'that are stupefied and carried away headlong with their several pleasures and lusts. "'Kebers in his table, St. Ambrose in his second book of Abel and Cain, "'and amongst the rest Lucian in his tract De Mercede Conductis, "'hath excellent and well deciphered such men's proceedings in his picture of Opulentia, "'whom he feigns to dwell on the top of a high mount, "'much sought after by many suitors.' At their first coming they are generally entertained by pleasure and dalliance, and have all the content that possibly may be given, so long as their money lasts. But when their means fail, they are contemptibly thrust out at a back door, headlong, and there left to shame, reproach, despair. And he at first that had so many attendants, parasites and followers, young and lusty, richly arrayed, and all the dainty fare that might be had, with all kind of welcome and good respect, is now upon a sudden stripped of all, pale, naked, old, diseased and forsaken, cursing his stars and ready to strangle himself, having no other company but repentance, sorrow, grief, derision, beggary and contempt, which are his daily attendants to his life's end. As the prodigal son had exquisite music, merry company, dainty fare at first, but a sorrowful reckoning in the end, so have all such vain delights and their followers. Tristes voluptatum exitus, et quisquis voluptatum suarum reminisci volet, intelliget. As bitter as gall and wormwood is their last, grief of mind, madness itself. The ordinary rocks upon which such men do impinge and precipitate themselves are cards, dice, hawks, and hounds. Insanum venandi studium, one calls it. Insane substructiones, their mad structures, disports, plays, etc., when they are unseasonably used, imprudently handled, and beyond their fortunes. Some men are consumed by mad fantastical buildings, 
by making galleries, cloisters, terraces, walks, orchards, gardens, pools, rillets, bowers, and such like places of pleasure. Inutiles domos, Xenophon calls them, which howsoever they be delightful things in themselves, and acceptable to all beholders, an ornament, and benefiting some great men, yet unprofitable to others, and the sole overthrow of their estates. Forestus, in his observations, hath an example of such a one that became melancholy upon the like occasion, having consumed his substance in an unprofitable building, which would afterward yield him no advantage. Others, I say, are overthrown by those mad sports of hawking and hunting, honest recreations, and fit for some great men, but not for every base inferior person, whilst they will maintain their falconers, dogs, and hunting nags, their wealth, says Salmutza, runs away with the hounds, and their fortunes fly away with hawks. They persecute beasts so long, till in the end they themselves degenerate into beasts, as Agrippa taxeth them, Acteon-like, for he was eaten to death by his own dogs. So do they devour themselves and their patrimonies in such idle and unnecessary disports, neglecting in the meantime their more necessary business, and to follow their vocations. Overmad too sometimes are our great men in delighting, and doting too much on it. When they drive poor husbandmen from their tillage, as Sarah's Buriensis objects, fling down country farms and whole towns to make parks and forests, starving men to feed beasts, and punishing in the meantime such a man that shall molest their game more severely than him that is otherwise a common hacker or a notorious thief. But great men are some ways to be excused. The meaner sort have no evasion why they should not be counted mad. Poggius the Florentine tells a merry story to this purpose, condemning the folly and impertinent business of such kind of persons. A physician of Milan, saith he, that cured madmen, had a pit of water in his house in which he kept his patients, some up to the knees, some to the girdle, some to the chin, for moda insanii, as they were more or less affected. One of them by chance, that was well recovered, stood in the door, and seeing a gallant ride by with a hawk on his fist, well mounted, with his spaniels after him, would need to know to what use all this preparation served. He made answer to kill certain fowls. The patient demanded again, what his fowl might be worth which he killed in a year. He replied, five or ten crowns. And when he urged him farther what his dogs, horse, and hawks stood him in, he told him four hundred crowns. With that the patient bade be gone, as he loved his life and welfare, for if our master come and find thee here, he will put thee in the pit amongst madmen up to the chin, taxing the madness and folly of such vain men that spend themselves in those idle sports, neglecting their business and necessary affairs. Leo Decimus, that hunting pope, is much discommended by Jovius in his life, for his immoderate desire of hawking and hunting, insomuch that, as he saith, he would sometimes live about Ostia weeks and months together, leave suitors unrespected, bulls and pardons unsigned, to his own prejudice and many private men's loss. And if he had been by chance crossed in his sport, or his game not so good, he was so impatient that he would revile and miscall many times men of great worth with most bitter taunts, look so sour, be so angry and waspish, so grieved and molested, that it is incredible to relate it. But if he had good sport, and been well pleased, on the other side, incredibili munificienta, with unspeakable bounty and munificence, he would reward all his fellow hunters, and deny nothing to any suitor when he was in that mood. To say truth, tis the common humour of all gamesters, as Galateus observes. If they win, no men living are so jovial and merry, but if they lose, though it be but a trifle, two or three games at tables, or dealing at cards for two pence a game, they are so choleric and testy that no man may speak with them, and break many times into violent passions, oaths, imprecations, and unbeseeming speeches, little differing from madmen for the time. Generally, of all gamesters and gaming, if it be excessive, thus much we may conclude, that whether they win or lose for the present, their winnings are not, munera fortuna, send insidii, as that wise Seneca determines, not fortune's gifts, but baits. The common catastrophe is beggary, ut pestis vitam, sic adimit alia pecuniam, as the plague takes away life, doth gaming goods, for omnes nude inopes et egeni. 
alea scilla vorax, species curtissima furti, non contenta bonis animum quoque perfida mergit, fida, furax, infamis, ines, furiosa, ruina. For a little pleasure they take, and some small gains and gettings now and then, their wives and children are ringed in the meantime, and they themselves with loss of body and soul rue it in the end. I will say nothing of those prodigious prodigals, perdendi pecuniae genitos, as he tat Antony, qui patrimonium sine ulla fore columnia amitunt, saith Cyprian, and mad sybaritical spendthrifts, quique una comedunt patrimonia coena, and eat up all at a breakfast, at a supper, or amongst boards, parasites and players, consumed themselves in an instant, as if they had flung it into Tiber with great wages, vain and idle expenses, etc., not themselves only, but even all their friends, as a man desperately swimming drowns him that comes to help him. By suretyship and borrowing, they willingly undo all their associates and allies. Irati pecunius, as he saith, angry with their money. What with a wanton eye, a liquorish tongue, and a gamesome hand, when they have indiscreetly impoverished themselves, mortgaged their wits, together with their lands, and entombed their ancestors' fair possessions in their bowels. They may lead the rest of their days in prison, as many times they do. They repent at leisure, and when all is gone, begin to be thrifty. But, sera est in fundo parsimonia, till then too late to look about, their end is misery, sorrow, shame, and discontent and well they deserve to be infamous and discontent. Catamidiari in amphitheatro, as by Adrian the Emperor's edict they were of old, decoctores bonorum suorum, as he calls them, prodigal fools to be publicly shamed and hissed out of all societies rather than to be pitied or relieved. The Tuscans and Boeotians brought their bankrupts into the marketplace in a beer with an empty purse carried before them, all the boys following, where they sat all day, circumstante plebe, to be infamous and ridiculous. At Padua in Italy they have a stone called the Stone of Turpitude, near the Senate House, where spendthrifts and such as disclaim non-payment of debts do sit with their hinder parts bare, that by that note of disgrace others may be terrified from all such vain expense, or borrowing more than they can tell how to pay. The civilians of old set guardians over such brain-sick prodigals, as they did over madmen, to moderate their expenses, that they should not so loosely consume their fortunes to the utter undoing of their families. I may not here omit those two main plagues and common dotages of humankind, wine and women, which have infatuated and besotted myriads of people. They go commonly together. Qui vino indulget, quemque aloa decoquit, Ille in venerem putret. To whom is sorrow, saith Solomon, Proverbs twenty three thirty nine. To whom is woe, but to such a one as loves drink? It causeth torture, vino tortures et ira, and bitterness of mind. Venum furoris, Jeremy calls it, wine of madness, as well he may, for insanere facit sanos. It makes sound men sick and sad, and wise men mad to say and do they know not what. Accidit hodie terribilis cassus, saith St. Augustine. Here a miserable accident. Cyrilus' son this day in his drink, matrum pregnantem nequiter oppressit, sororum violare voluit, patrum oxidit fere, et duas alias sorores ad mortem vulneravit. Would have violated his sister, killed his father, etc. A true saying it was of him, Vino dari laetitiam et dolorum. Drink causeth mirth, and drink causeth sorrow. Drink causeth poverty and want. Proverbs 21. Shame and disgrace. Multi ignobiles evasere of vinum potum, et, Augustine, amissis honoribus profugi aberavant. Many men have made shipwreck of their fortunes, and go like rogues and beggars, having turned all their substance into orum portabile that otherwise might have lived in good worship and happy estate, and for a few hours' pleasure, for their Hilary terms but short, or free madness as Seneca calls it, purchase unto themselves eternal tediousness and trouble. 
The other madness is on women. Apostatare facit cor, saith the wise man, adque homine cerebrum minuit. Pleasant at first she is, like Dioscorides Rhododaphne, that fair plant to the eye, but poison to the taste, the rest as bitter as wormwood in the end, and sharp as a two-edged sword. Her house is the way to hell, and goes down to the chambers of death. What more sorrowful can be said? They are miserable in this life, mad beasts, led like oxen to the slaughter, and that which is worse, whoremasters and drunkards shall be judged. Amatunt gratiam, saith Augustine, perdunt gloriam, incurrent damnationum aeternum. They lose grace and glory. Brevis illa voluptas, abrogat aeternum cali decus. They gain hell and eternal damnation. End of section 36section thirty seven of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by morgan scorpion the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section thirty seven partition one section two member three subsection fourteen Pilotia, or self-love, vainglory, praise, honour, immoderate applause, pride, overmuch joy, etc., causes. Self-love, pride, and vainglory, cacus amor sui, which Chrysostom calls one of the devil's three great nets, Bernard, an arrow which pierceth the soul through, and slays it, a sly, insensible enemy, not perceived, are main causes. Where neither anger, lust, covetousness, fear, sorrow, etc., nor any other perturbation can they hold, this will slyly and insensibly pervert us. Quem non gula vicit pilotia superavit, saith Cyprian, whom surfeiting could not overtake, self-love hath overcome. He hath scorned all money, bribes, gifts, upright otherwise and sincere, hath inserted himself to no fond imagination and sustained all those tyrannical concupiscences of the body, hath lost all his honour, captivated by vainglory. Chrysostom, sub eo, tu sola animum mentemque peruris, gloria, a great assault and cause of our present malady, although we do most part neglect, take no notice of it, yet this is a violent batterer of our souls, causeth melancholy and dotage. This pleasing humour, this soft and whispering popular air, amabilis insania, this delectable frenzy, most irrefragable passion, mentis gratissimus error, this acceptable disease, which so sweetly sets upon us, ravisheth our senses, lulls our souls asleep, puffs up our hearts as so many bladders, and that without all feeling, insomuch as those that are misaffected with it, never so much as once perceive it, or think of any cure. We commonly love him best in this malady, that doth us most harm, and are very willing to be hurt. Dula tonibus nostris libentur facemus, saith Jerome, we love him, we love him for it. O bronchiari suave, suave fuit ate tali haec, twas sweet to hear it. And as Pliny doth ingenuously confess to his dear friend Augurinus, all thy writings are most acceptable, but those especially that speak of us. Again, a little after to Maximus. I cannot express how pleasing it is to me to hear myself commended. Though we smile to ourselves, at least ironically, when parasites bedaub us with false encomiums, as many princes cannot choose but do, Cum tale quid nihil intra se reperint. When they know they come as far short as a mouse to an elephant of any such virtues, yet it doth us good. Though we seem many times to be angry and blush at our own praises, yet our souls inwardly rejoice. It puffs us up. Tis phallax suavitas blandus daemon. Makes us swell beyond our bounds and forget ourselves. Her two daughters are lightness of mind, 
immoderate joy, and pride, not excluding those other concomitant vices, which Iodocus Lorichius reckons up, bragging, hypocrisy, peevishness, and curiosity. Now the common cause of this mischief ariseth from ourselves or others. We are active and passive. It proceeds inwardly from ourselves, as we are active causes, from an overweening conceit we have of our good parts, own worth, which indeed is no worth, our bounty, favour, grace, valour, strength, wealth, patience, meekness, hospitality, beauty, temperance, gentry, knowledge, wit, science, art, learning, our excellent gifts and fortunes, for which Narcissus-like we admire, flatter, and applaud ourselves, and think all the world esteems so of us, and as deformed women easily believe those that tell them they be fair, we are too credulous of our own good parts and praises, too well persuaded of ourselves. We brag and vendidate our own works, and scorn all others in respect of us, in flatis scientia, saith Paul, our wisdom, our learning, all our geese are swans, and we as basely esteem and vilify other men's, as we do over highly prize and value our own. We will not suffer them to be in secundus, no, not in tertius. What, mecum conferta Ulysses? They are mures, muscae, culices praesae, nits and flies compared to his inexorable and supercilious, eminent and arrogant worship, though indeed they be far before him. Only wise, only rich, only fortunate, valorous and fair, puffed up with this timpany of self-conceit, as that proud Pharisee, they are not, as they suppose, like other men, of a purer and more precious metal. Soli re gerendi sunt efficaces, which that wise periander held of such. Meditanto omne qui prius negotium, etc. Novi quendum, saith Erasmus. I knew one so arrogant that he thought himself inferior to no man living, like Calisthenes the philosopher, that neither held Alexander's acts, nor any other subject worthy of his pen, such was his insolency, or Seleucus, king of Syria, who thought none fit to contend with him but the Romans. Eos solos dignos ratus quibuscum de imperio certaret. That which Tully writ to Atticus long since is still in force. There was never yet true poet nor orator that thought any other better than himself. And such for the most part are your princes, potentates, great philosophers, historiographers, authors of sects or heresies, and all our great scholars, as Hiram defines. A natural philosopher is a glorious creature, and a very slave of rumour, fame, and public opinion. And though they write de contemptu gloriae, yet, as he observes, they will put their names to their books. Vobis et famae, me semper dedi, saith Trebellius Pollio, I have wholly consecrated myself to you and fame. Tis all my desire, night and day, tis all my study to raise my name. Proud Pliny seconds him, quam quam o, etc., and that vainglorious orator is not ashamed to confess in an epistle of his to Marcus Lecaeus. Audeo incredibili cubididate, etc. I burn with an incredible desire to have my name registered in thy book. Out of this fountain proceed all those cracks and brags. Speramus camina finge, posse linenda cedro, et leni servanda cupresso. Non usitata nec tenui fera penna, nec in terra mora longis. Nil pavum aut humili modo, nil mortale loco. Dica qua violens obstrepit, o sidus, exegi monumentum aere perennius. Iamque opus exegi, court nec jovis ira, nec ignis, etc. Cum venit ille dies, etc. Parte tamen meliore, me super alta perennis astra fera, nomenque erit indelibe nostrum. This of Ovid I have paraphrased in English. And when I am dead and gone, my corpse laid under a stone, my fame shall yet survive, and I shall be alive, in these my works for ever, my glory shall persevere, etc. And that of Ennius. 
Nemo me la quismis decoret, neque funera fletu faxit cur, volito, doctor per ora virum. Let none shed tears over me, or adorn my beer with sorrow, because I am eternally in the mouths of men. With many such proud strains, and foolish flashes too common with writers. Not so much as Democaris on the tropics, but he will be immortal. Tipotius de Fama shall be famous, and well he deserves, because he writ of fame, and every trivial poet must be renowned. Plosuque petit clarescare vulgai. He seeks the applause of the public. This puffing humour it is, that hath produced so many great tomes, built such famous monuments, strong castles, and mausolean tombs, to have their acts eternized. Digito monstrari et dicier hic est to be pointed at with the finger, and to have it said, there he goes, to see their names inscribed, as Phryne on the walls of Thebes. Phryne fecit. This causeth so many bloody battles, et noctes cogit vigilare serenus, and induces us to watch during calm nights, long journeys, magnum iter intendo, sed dat mihi gloria vires, I contemplate a monstrous journey, but the love of glory strengthens me for it, gaining honour, a little applause, pride, self-love, vainglory. This is it which makes them take such pains, and break into those ridiculous strains, this high conceit of themselves, to scorn all others. Ridiculo fastu et intolerando contemptu, as Palemon the grammarian contemned Varro. Secum et natus et morituras literas jactam, and brings them to the height of insolency, that they cannot endure to be contradicted, or hear of anything but their own commendation, which Hierom notes of such kind of men. And as Austin well seconds him, tis their sole study day and night to be commended and applauded, when as indeed, in all wise men's judgments, quibus corsapit, they are mad, empty vessels, fudges, beside themselves, derided, et ut camelus in proverbio querens cornua, etiam quas habebat ores amisit. Their works are toys, as an almanac out of date, authoris pereunt garulitate sui. They seek fame and immortality, but reap dishonour and infamy. They are a common obloquy, insensate, insensati, and come far short of that which they suppose or expect. O pua ut sis vitalis metuo! How much I dread thy days are short! Some lord shall strike thee dead! Of so many myriads of poets, rhetoricians, philosophers, sophisters, as Eusebius well observes, which have written in former ages, scarce one of a thousand's works remains. Nomina et libri simul cum corporibus interierunt, their books and bodies are perished together. It is not, as they vainly think, they shall surely be admired and immortal, as one told Philip of Macedon insultingly, after a victory, that his shadow was no longer than before, we may say to them, Nos demiramur, sed non cum deside vulgo, sed velut hapius, gorgonus et furius. We marvel too, not as the vulgar we, but as we gorgons, harpies, or furies see. Or if we do applaud, honour, and admire, quota pars, how small a part in respect of the whole world, never so much as hears our names, how few take notice of us, how slender a tract, as scant as Alcibiades land in a map. And yet every man must and will be immortal, as he hopes, and extend his fame to our antipodes, when as half, no, not a quarter of his own province or city, neither knows nor hears of him. But say they did. What's a city to a kingdom, a kingdom to Europe, Europe to the world, the world itself that must have an end, if compared to the least visible star in the firmament, eighteen times bigger than it. And then, if those stars be infinite, and every star there be a sun, as some will, and as this sun of ours hath his planets about him, all inhabited, what proportion bear we to them, and where's our glory? 
orbum terrarum victor Romanus habebat, as he cracked in Portronius. All the world was under Augustus, and so in Constantine's time, Eusebius brags he governed all the world, universum mundum, preclare ad mormum administravit, et omnes orbis gentes imperatori subjecti. So of Alexander it is given out, the four monarchies, etc., when as neither Greeks nor Romans ever had the fifteenth part of the now known world, nor half of that which was then described. What braggadocios are they, and we then? Quam brevis hic de nobis sermo, as he said, prodebit auctu nominis, how short a time, how little a while doth this fame of ours continue? Every private province, every small territory and city, when we have all done, will yield as generous spirits, as brave examples in all respects, as famous as ourselves. Cadwallader in Wales, Rollo in Normandy, Robin Hood and Little John, are as much renowned in Sherwood as Caesar in Rome, Alexander in Greece, or his Hephaestion, omnis aetas omnisque populus in exemplum et admirationem veniet. Every town, city, book is full of brave soldiers, senators, scholars, and though Braculus was a worthy captain, a good man, and as they thought, not to be matched in Lacedaemon, yet as his mother truly said, plures habet Sparta bracida meliores. Sparta had many better men than ever he was, and howsoever thou admirest thyself, thy friend, many an obscure fellow the world never took notice of, had been in place or action, would have done much better than he, or he, or thou thyself. Another kind of madman there is opposite to these, that are insensibly mad, and know not of it, such as contemn all praise and glory, think themselves most free, when as indeed they are most mad, calcant sed alio fastu, a company of cynics, such as are monks, hermits, anchorites, that contemn the world, contemn themselves, contemn all titles, honours, offices, and yet in that contempt are more proud than any man living whatsoever. They are proud in humility, proud in that they are not proud, sapo homo de vanae gloriae contemptu, vanius gloriato, as Augustine hath it, Confessiones, Book 10, Chapter 38. Like Diogenes, intus glorianter, they brag inwardly, and feed themselves fat with a self-conceit of sanctity, which is no better than hypocrisy. They go in sheep's russet, many great men that might maintain themselves in cloth of gold, and seem to be dejected, humble by their outward carriage, when as inwardly they are swollen full of pride, arrogancy, and self-conceit. And therefore Seneca adviseth his friend Lucilius, in his attire and gesture, outward actions, especially to avoid all such things as are more notable in themselves, as a rugged attire, hirsute head, horrid beard, contempt of money, coarse lodging, and whatsoever leads to fame that opposite way. All this madness yet proceeds from ourselves, the main engine which batters us is from others, we are merely passive in this business, from a company of parasites and flatterers, that with immoderate praise and bombast epithets, glossing titles, false eulogiums, so bedaub and applaud, gild over many a silly and undeserving man, that they clap him quite out of his wits. Res imprimis violenta est, as Hiram notes, this common applause is a most violent thing, laudum placenta, a drum fife and trumpet cannot so animate, that fattens men, erects and dejects them in an instant. Palma negata macrum, donata reducit opimum. It makes them fat and lean, as frost doth conies. And who is that mortal man that can so contain himself, that if he be immoderately commended and applauded, will not be moved? Let him be what he will, those parasites will overturn him. If he be a king, he is one of the nine worthies, more than a man, a god forthwith, edictum domini deque nostri, and they will sacrifice unto him. Divinus, si tu platiaris honores, ultra ipsi dabmus meritasque sacrabimus aris. If he be a soldier, then Themistocles, Epaminondas, Hector, Achilles, duo fulmina belli, 
trium viri terrarum, etc., and the valour of both Scipios is too little for him. He is invictissimus, serenissimus, multis trophaeus ornatissimus, naturae dominus. Although he be Lepus Galeatus, indeed a very coward, a milksop, and, as he said of Xerxes, postremus in pugna, primus in fuga, and such a one as never durst look his enemy in the face. If he be a big man, then he is a Samson, another Hercules. If he pronounce a speech, another Tully or Demosthenes. As of Herod in the Acts, the voice of God and not of man. If he can make a verse, Homer, Virgil, etc. And then my silly weak patient takes all these eulogiums to himself. If he be a scholar so commended for his much reading, excellent style, method, etc., he will eviscerate himself like a spider, study to death. Laudatus ostendit avis junonia pennas. Peacock-like he will display all his feathers. If he be a soldier and so applauded, his valour extolled, though it be impar congressus, as that of Troilus and Achilles, in Felix Pua, he will combat with a giant, run first upon a breach, as another Philippus, he will ride into the thickest of his enemies. Commend his housekeeping, and he will beggar himself. Commend his temperance, he will starve himself. Laudataque virtus crescit, et immensum gloria calca habet. He is mad, 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 no woe with him, impatiens consortis erit. He will over the Alps to be talked of, or to maintain his credit. Commend an ambitious man, some proud prince or potentate, si plus equo laudator, saith Erasmus, Christus erigit exuit hominem. Deum se putat. He sets up his crest, and will be no longer a man, but a god. Nihil est quod credere de se, non audet quum laudato, dies aqua potestas. How did this work with Alexander, that would needs be Jupiter's son, and go like Hercules in a lion's skin? Domitian, a god, Dominus Deus Nostus sic fiere jubet. Like the Persian kings, whose image was adored by all that came into the city of Babylon. Commodus the emperor was so gulled by his flattering parasites that he must be called Hercules. Antonius the Roman would be crowned with ivy, carried in a chariot, and adored for Bacchus. Cotis, king of Thrace, was married to Minerva, and sent three several messengers one after another to see if she were come to his bedchamber. Such a one was Jupiter Menecrates. Maximinus, Jovianus, Diocletianus Hercules. Sapor, the Persian king, brother of the sun and moon, and our modern Turks, that will be gods on earth, kings of kings, gods shadow, commanders of all that may be commanded, are kings of China and Tartary in this present age. Such a one was Xerxes that would whip the sea, better Neptune, Stulter Jactantia, and send a challenge to Mount Athos, and such are many sottish princes, brought into a fool's paradise by their parasites. Tis a common humour, incident to all men, when they are in great places, or come to the solstice of honour, have done or deserved well, to applaud and flatter themselves. Stultitiam suum prudent, etc., saith Platerus. Your very tradesmen, if they be excellent, will crack and brag, and show their folly in excess. They have good parts, and they know it. You need not tell them of it. Out of a conceit of their worth, they go smiling to themselves, a perpetual meditation of their trophies and plaudits. They run at last quite mad and lose their wits. Petrarch, Book One, De Contemptu Mundi, confessed as much of himself, and Cardan, in his fifth book of wisdom, gives an instance in a smith of Milan, a fellow citizen of his, one Gallius de Rubeus, that being commended for refining of an instrument of Archimedes, for joy ran mad. Plutarch, in the life of Artaxerxes, hath such a like story of one Camus, a soldier, that wounded King Cyrus in battle, and grew thereupon so arrogant, that in a short space after he lost his wits. So many men, if any knew honour, office, preferment, booty, treasure, possession, or patrimony, ex inspirato fall unto them for immoderate joy, and continual meditation of it, 
cannot sleep or tell what they say or do. They are so ravished on a sudden, and with vain conceits transported. There is no rule with them. Epaminondas, therefore, the next day, after his Lugtrian victory, came abroad all squalid and submiss, and gave no other reason to his friends of so doing, than that he perceived himself the day before, by reason of his good fortune, to be too insolent, overmuch joyed. That wise and virtuous lady, Queen Catherine, dowager of England, in private talk, upon like occasion, said that she would not willingly endure the extremity of either fortune, but if it were so, that of necessity she must undergo the one, she would be in adversity, because comfort was never wanting in it, but still counsel and government were defective in the other. They could not moderate themselves. End of section 37section thirty eight of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anna simon the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section thirty eight partition one section two member three subsection fifteen part one love of learning or overmuch study with a digression of the misery of scholars and why the muses are melancholy leonardus fuxius felix plater hercules of saxonia speak of a peculiar fury which comes by overmuch study fernelius book one chapter eighteen puts study contemplation and continual meditation as an especial cause of madness and in his eighty sixth consultation cites the same words johannes arculanus in liber nine raises at alnansurum chapter sixteen amongst other causes reckons up studium vehemens so doth levinus lemnius libri de occultus naturae miraculus book one chapter sixteen many men saith he come to this malady by continual study and night waking and of all other men scholars are most subject to it and such rasses adds that have commonly the finest wits marcellius ficinus the sanitata tuenda book one chapter seven puts melancholy amongst one of those five principal plagues of students tis a common maw unto them all and almost in some measure an inseparable companion Vero belike for that cause calls trist philosophos et severos severe sad dry tetric are common epithets to scholars and patricius therefore in the institution of princes would not have them to be great students for as machiavel holds study weakens their bodies dulls the spirits abates their strength and courage and good scholars are never good soldiers which a certain goth well perceived for when his countrymen came into Greece, and would have burned all their books, he cried out against it, by no means they should do it, leave them that plague, which in time will consume all their vigour and martial spirits. The Turks abdicated Cornutus the next heir from the empire, because he was so much given to his book. And is the common tenet of the world, that learning dulls and diminisheth the spirits, and so per consequence produceth melancholy." two main reasons may be given of it why students should be more subject to this malady than others the one is they live a sedentary solitary life sibi et musis free from bodily exercise and those ordinary disports which other men use and many times if discontent and idleness concur with it which is too frequent they are precipitated into this gulf on a sudden but the common cause is overmuch study too much learning as festus told paul hath made thee mad. Tis that other extreme which affects it. So did Trincavelius find by his experience in two of his patients, a young baron and another that contracted this malady by too vehement study. So Forestus, in a young divine in Louvain, that was mad, and said he had a Bible in his head. Marcidius Ficinus, the Sanitat Tuenda, Book 1, Chapters 1, 3, 4, and Book 2, Chapter 16, gives many reasons why students dote more often than others. The first is their negligence. 
other men look to their tools, a painter will wash his pencils, a smith will look to his hammer, anvil, forge, a husbandman will mend his plough-irons, and grind his hatchet if it be dull, a falconer or huntsman will have an especial care of his hawks, hounds, horses, dogs, etc. A musician will string and unstring his lute, etc. Only scholars neglect that instrument, their brain and spirits, I mean, which they daily use, and by which they range over all the world, which by much study is consumed. Vide, said Lucian, ne funiculum nimis intendendo aliquando lamprumpas. See thou twist not the rope so hard till at length it break. Facinus, in his fourth chapter, gives some other reasons. Saturn and Mercury, the patrons of learning, they are both dry planets, and Origanus assigns the same cause, why mercurialists are so poor and most part beggars, for that their president Mercury has no better fortune himself. The destinies of old put poverty upon him as a punishment, since when poetry and beggary are gemelli, twin-born brats, inseparable companions, and to this day is every scholar poor, gross gold from them runs headlong to the boor. Mercury can help them to knowledge, but not to money. The second is contemplation, which dries the brain and extinguisheth natural heat. For whilst the spirits are intent to meditation above in the head, the stomach and liver are left destitute, and thence come black blood and crudities by defect of concoction, and for want of exercise the superfluous vapours cannot exhale, etc. The same reasons are repeated by Gomesius, Johannes Vossius, Book 2, Chapter 5, De Peste and something more they add, that hard students are commonly troubled with gouts, catars, rheums, cachexia, bradiopepsia, bad eyes, stone and colic, crudities, oppilations, vertigo, winds, consumptions, and all such diseases as come by overmuch sitting. They are most part lean, dry, ill-coloured, spend their fortunes, lose their wits, and many times their lives, and all through immoderate pains and extraordinary studies. If you will not believe the truth of this, look upon great Tostatus and Thomas Aquinas's works, and tell me whether those men took pains. Peruse Augustine, Hierom, etc., and many thousands besides. Qui cupit optatam cursu contingere metam, multa tulit, fecit quipuer, so David et alsit. He that desires this wished goal to gain must sweat and freeze before he can attain, and labor hard for it. So did Seneca, by his own confession, Epistle 8. Not a day that I spend idle, part of the night I keep mine eyes open, tired with waking, and now slumbering to their continual task. Hear Tully, pro archia poeta. Whilst others loitered and took their pleasures, he was continually at his book, so they do that will be scholars, and that to the hazard, I say, of their health, fortunes, wits, and lives. How much did Aristotle and Ptolemy spend? Unius regni precium, they say, more than a king's ransom. How many crowns per annum, to perfect arts, the one about his history of creatures, the other on his almagest? How much time did Thebet Bancroft employ to find out the motion of the eighth sphere? Forty years and more, some write, how many poor scholars have lost their wits, or become dizzards, neglecting all worldly affairs and their own health, wealth, esse and bene esse, to gain knowledge for which, after all their pains, in this world's esteem, they are accounted ridiculous and silly fools, idiots, asses, and, as oft they are, rejected, contempt, derided, doting and mad. Look for examples in Hildesheim, read Trincavellius, Montanus, Garcius, Mercurialis, Prosper Calinius, in his book De Atra Bile, go to Bethlehem and ask, or, if they keep their wits, yet they are esteemed scrubs and fools by reason of their carriage. After seven years' study, Statua taciturnius exit, plerumque et risum populu quetit. He becomes more silent than a statue, and generally excites people's laughter, because they cannot ride a horse, which every clown can do, salute and call a gentlewoman, Carve a table, cringe and make conjures, which every common swasher can do, hos populus ridet, etc. They are laughed to scorn, and accounted silly fools by our gallants. 
Hey, many times, such is their misery, they deserve it. A mere scholar, a mere ass. Obstipo capite, et figentis lumine teram, murma cum secum, et rabiosa silentia rodunt, atque experecto trutinantur verba labello, e grotti veteris meditantes somnia, gini de nihilo nihilum, in nihilum nil posse reverti. Who do lean awry their heads, piercing the earth with a fixed eye, when, by themselves, they ignore their murmuring and furious silence, as twere balancing each word upon their outstretched lip, and when they meditate the dreams of old sick men, as, out of nothing, nothing can be brought, and that which is can never be turned to naught. Thus they go commonly meditating unto themselves, thus they sit, such is their action and gesture. Fulgus's Book 8, Chapter 7, makes mention how Thomas Aquinas, supping with King Louis of France, upon a sudden knocked his fist upon the table, and cried, Conclusum est contra manicheus. His wits were a wool-gathering, as they say, and his head busied about other matters. When he perceived his error, he was much abashed. Such a story there is of Archimedes in Vitruvius, that, having found out the means to know how much gold was mingled with the silver in King Hiran's crown, ran naked forth of the bath and cried, Eureka, I have found, and was commonly so intent to his studies that he never perceived what was done about him. When the city was taken, and the soldiers now ready to rifle his house, he took no notice of it. St. Bernard rode all day long by the Lemnian lake, and asked at last where he was, Morellus. It was Democritus's carriage alone that made the Abderites suppose him to have been mad, and sent for Hippocrates to cure him. If he had been in any solemn company, he would upon all occasions fall a-laughing. Theophrastus said as much of Heraclitus, for that he continually wept, and Laertius of Menedemus, Lampsacus, because he ran like a madman, saying he came from hell as a spy to tell the devils what mortal man did. Your greatest students are commonly no better, silly, soft fellows in their outward behaviour, absurd, ridiculous to others, and no wit experienced in worldly business. They can measure the heavens, range over the world, teach others wisdom, and yet in bargains and contracts they are circumvented by every base tradesman. Are not these men fools? And how should they be otherwise, but as so many sots in schools, when, as he well observed, they neither hear nor see such things as are commonly practised abroad. How should they get experience? By what means? I knew in my time many scholars, said Aeneas Silvius, in an epistle of his to Gaspar Scytic, Chancellor to the Emperor, excellent well learned, but so rude, so silly, that they had no common civility, nor knew how to manage their domestic or public affairs. Paglarensis was amazed, and said his farmer had surely cozened him when he heard him tell that his sow had eleven pigs, and his ass had been one foal. To say the best of his profession, I can give no other testimony of them in general than that of Pliny of Isaeus. He is yet a scholar, than which kind of man there is nothing so simple, so sincere, none better. They are most part harmless, honest, upright, innocent, plain-dealing men." Now, because they are commonly subject to such hazards and inconveniences as dotage, madness, simplicity, etc., Johannes Vossius would have good scholars to be highly rewarded, and had in some extraordinary respect above other men to have greater privileges than the rest that adventure themselves and abbreviate their lives for the public good. But our patrons of learning are so far nowadays from respecting the muses and giving that honour to scholars or reward which they deserve, and are allowed by those indulgent privileges of many noble princes, that after all their pains taken in the universities, cost and charge, expenses, irksome hours, laborious tasks, wearisome days, dangers, hazards, barred interim from all pleasures which other men have, mewed up like hawks all their lives, if they chance to wade through them, they shall in the end be rejected, contempt, and which is their greatest misery, driven to their shifts, exposed to want, poverty, and beggary. Their familiar attendants are palentis morbi, luctus, curique, laborque, et metus, et malesueda famis, et turpis igestas, 
terribiles visu formae. Grief, labor, care, pale sickness, miseries, fear, filthy poverty, hunger that cries, terrible monsters to be seen with eyes. If there were nothing else to trouble them, the conceit of this alone were enough to make them all melancholy. Most other trades and professions, after some seven years' apprenticeship, are enabled by their craft to live of themselves. A merchant adventures his goods at sea, and though his hazard be great, yet if one ship return of four, he likely makes a saving voyage. An husbandman's gains are almost certain. Quibus ipse Jupiter no granum potest. Whom Jove himself can't harm. Tis Cato's hyperbole, a great husband himself. Only scholars, methinks, are most uncertain, unrespected, subject to all casualties and hazards. For, first, not one of a many proves to be a scholar. All are not capable and docile. Ex omni ligno non fit mercurius. We can make majors and officers every year, but not scholars. Kings can invest knights and barons, as Sigismund the emperor confessed. Universities can give degrees, and tu quod es e populo quilibit esse potest. But he nor they, nor all the world, can give learning, make philosophers, artists, orators, poets. We can soon say, as Seneca well notes, O veum bonum, O divitem, point at a rich man, a good, a happy man, a prosperous man. Sumptuoso vestitum, calamistratum bene olentem, magno temporis impendio constat hic laudatio, o virum literarum. But it is not so easily performed to find out a learned man. Learning is not so quickly got, though they may be willing to take pains, to that end sufficiently informed, and liberally maintained by their patrons and parents, yet few can compass it. Or if they be docile, yet all men's wills are not answerable to their wits, they can apprehend, but will not take pains. They are either seduced by bad companions, vel in poelum impingunt, vel in poculum, they fall in with women or wine, and so spend their time to their friends' grief and their own undoings. Or, put case, they be studious, industrious, of ripe wits, and perhaps good capacities. Then how many diseases of body and mind must they encounter? No labor in the world like unto study. It may be that temperature will not endure it, but striving to be excellent to know all, they lose health, wealth, wit, life, and all. Let him yet happily escape all these hazards, eris intestinis with a body of brass, and is now consummate and ripe. He hath profited in his studies, and proceeded with all applause. After many expenses, he is fit for preferment. Where shall he have it? He is as far to seek it as he was, after twenty years' standing, at the first day of his coming to the university. For what course shall he take, being now capable and ready? The most parable and easy, and about which many are employed, is to teach a school, turn lecturer or curate, and for that he shall have falconer's wages, ten pound per annum, and his diet, or some small stipend, so long as he can please his patron or the parish. If they approve him not, for usually they do but a year or two, as inconstant as they that cried Hosanna one day, and crucify him the other. Serving men like, he must go look a new master. If they do, what is his reward? Hoc quoque temanet ut pueros elementa docentem occupet extremis in vicis alba senectus. At last thy snow-white age in suburb schools shall toil in teaching boys their grammar rules. Like an ass he wears out his time for provender, and can show a stump rod, togam tritam et lacaram, saith Hedas, an old torn gown, an ensign of his infelicity. He hath his labour for his pain, a modicum to keep him till he be decrepit, and that is all. Grammaticus non est felix, etc. If he be a trencher chaplain in a gentleman's house, as it befell Euphormio, after some seven years' service, he may perchance have a living to the halves, or some small rectory with the mother of the maids at length, a poor kinswoman, or a cracked chambermaid, to have and to hold during the time of his life. But if he offend his good patron, or displease his lady mistress in the meantime, Ducator planta velut ictus ab herculocacus, ponetur quer foras, si quid tentaverit unquam hisca. As Hercules did by Cacus, he shall be dragged forth of doors by the heels, 
away with him. If he bent his forces to some other studies, with an intent to be a secretist to some nobleman, or in such a place with an ambassador, he shall find that these persons rise like apprentices one under another, and in so many tradesmen's shops, when the master is dead, the foreman of the shop commonly steps in his place. Now, for poets, rhetoricians, historians, philosophers, mathematicians, sophisters, etc., they are like grasshoppers, sing they must in summer, and pine in the winter, for there is no preferment for them. Even so they were at first, if you will believe that pleasant tale of Socrates, which he told fair Phaedrus under a plane tree at the banks of the river Isseus. About noon when it was hot, and the grasshoppers made a noise, he took that sweet occasion to tell him a tale, how grasshoppers were once scholars, musicians, poets, etc., before the muses were born, and lived without meat and drink, and for that cause were turned by Jupiter into grasshoppers, and may be turned again in Tithonicicadas aut liciorum ranas, for any reward I see they are like to have, or else in the meantime I would they could live as they did without any viaticum, like so many manucodiate, those Indian birds of paradise, as we commonly call them, those, I mean, that live with the air and dew of heaven, and need no other food, for, being as they are, their rhetoric only serves them to curse their bad fortunes, and many of them, for want of means, are driven to hard shifts. From grasshoppers they turn humble-bees and wasps, plain parasites, and make the muses mules to satisfy their hunger-starred ponges, and get a meal's meat. To say truth, is the common fortune of most scholars to be servile and poor, to complain pitifully, and lay open their wants to their respectless patrons, as Cardin doth, as Xylander, and many others, and which is too common in those dedicatory epistles for hope of gain, to lie, flatter, and with hyperbolical eulogisms and commendations, to magnify and extol an illiterate, unworthy idiot for his excellent virtues, whom they should rather, as Machiavel observes, vilify and rail at downright for his most notorious villainies and vices. So they prostitute themselves as fiddlers, or mercenary tradesmen, to serve great men's turns for a small reward. They are like Indians, they have store of gold, but know not the worth of it. For I am of Synesius's opinion, King Hiron got more by Simonides' acquaintance than Simonides did by his. They have their best education, good institution, sole qualification from us, and when they have done well, their honour and immortality from us. We are the living tombs, registers, and as so many trumpeters of their fames. What was Achilles without Homer, Alexander without Arian and Curtius, who had known the Caesars but for Suetonius and Dion? Fixorunt fortes ante agamemnona multi, sed omnis illacrimabilis urgentur ignotique longa nocte, carent quievate sacro. Before great Agamemnon reigned, reigned kings as great as he and brave, whose huge ambitions now contained in the small compass of grave, in endless night they sleep unwept, unknown, no bard they had to make all time their own. They are more beholden to scholars than scholars to them, but they undervalue themselves, and so by those great men are kept down. Let them have that encyclopedian, all the learning in the world, they must keep it to themselves, live in base esteem, and starve, except they will submit, as Budaeus well hath it, so many good parts, so many ensigns of arts, virtues, be slavishly obnoxious to some illiterate potentate, and live under his insolent worship, or honour, like parasites, qui tanquam mures alienum panem comedunt, for to say truth, artus he non sunt lucrative, as Guido Bonat, that great astrologer, could foresee, they be not gainful arts these, set esurientes et familice, but poor and hungry. Dat Galenus opes, dat Justinianus honores, set genus et species cogito irapedis. The rich physician, honoured lawyers, ride, whilst the poor scholar foots it by their side. Poverty is the muse's patrimony, and as that poetical divinity teacheth us, when Jupiter's daughters were each of them married to the gods, the muses alone were left solitary, Helicon forsaken of all suitors, and I believe it was because they had no portion. Calliope longum celebs cur vixit in avum, 
nempe nihil dotus, quod numeraret, erat. Why did Calliope live so long a maid? Because she had no dowry to be paid. Ever since all their followers are poor, forsaken, and left unto themselves, insomuch that, as Petronius argues, you shall likely know them by their clothes. There came, saith he, by chance into my company, a fellow not very spruce to look on, that I could perceive by that note alone he was a scholar, whom commonly rich men hate. I asked him what he was. He answered, a poet. I demanded again why he was so ragged. He told me this kind of learning never made any man rich. Qui pelago credit, magno se fenora tolit. Qui pugna set rostra petit, precingitur auro. Vilis adulator, picto, jacet, ebrius ostro. Sola pruinosis horret facundia panis. A merchant's gain is great that goes to sea. A soldier embossed all in gold. A flatterer lies foxed in brave array. A scholar only, ragged to behold. All which our ordinary students, right well perceiving in the universities, how unprofitable these poetical, mathematical, and philosophical studies are, how little respected, how few patrons, apply themselves in all haste to those three commodious professions of law, physic, and divinity, sharing themselves between them, rejecting these arts in the meantime, history, philosophy, philology, or lightly passing them over, as pleasant toys fitting only table-talk, and to furnish them with discourse. They are not so behoveful. He that can tell his money hath arithmetic enough. He is a true geometrician that can measure out a good fortune to himself, a perfect astrologer that can cast the rise and fall of others, and mark their errant motions to his own use. The best optics are to reflect the beams of some great man's favour and grace to shine upon him. He is a good engineer that alone can make an instrument to get preferment. This was the common tenet and practice of Poland, as Cromerus observed not long since, in the first book of his history. Their universities were generally base, not a philosopher, a mathematician, an antiquary, etc., to be found of any note amongst them, because they had no set reward or stipend. But every man betook himself to divinity, hoc solum in votus habens, opimum sacerdotium. A good parsonage was their aim. This was the practice of some of our near neighbours, as Lipsius inveys. They thrust their children to the study of law and divinity, before they be informed aright, or capable of such studies. Scilicet omnibus artibus antistat spes lucri, et formosior est cumulus auri, quam quiquit greci latiniqui delirantes scripserunt ex hoc numo de inde veniunt ad gubernacula repub intersunt et praesunt consilis regum, o pater, o patria, so he complained, and so may others. For even so we find, to serve a great man, to get an office in some bishop's court, to practice in some good town, or compass a benefice, is the mark we shoot at, as being so advantageous, the highway to preferment. End of section 38 Section 39 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 By Robert Burton Section 39 Partition 1, Section 2, Member 3, Subsection 15, Part 2. Love of learning, or overmuch study, with a digression of the misery of scholars, and why the muses are melancholy, continued. Although many times, for aught I can see, these men fail as often as the rest in their projects, and are as usually frustrate of their hopes. For let him be a doctor of the law, an excellent civilian of good worth, where shall he practice and expatiate? Their fields are so scant, the civil law with us so contracted with the prohibitions, so few causes, by reason of those all-devouring municipal laws, quibus nihil illiteratius, saith Erasmus, an illiterate and a barbarous study, for though they be never so well learned in it, I can hardly vouchsafe them the name of scholars, except they be otherwise qualified. 
and so few courts are left to that profession, such slender offices, and those commonly to be compassed at such dear rates, that I know not how an ingenious man should thrive amongst them. Now, for physicians, there are in every village so many mountebanks, empirics, quack salvers, paracelsians, as they call themselves, caucifici et sanicide, so Clenet terms them, wizards, alchemists, poor vicars, cast apothecaries, physicians' men, barbers, and good wives, professing great skill, that I make great doubt how they shall be maintained, or who shall be their patients. Besides, there are so many of both sorts, and some of them such harpies, so covetous, so clamorous, so impudent, and, as he said, litigious idiots, quote, quibus loquacis afatim arrogantiae est, pentrie parum aut nihil, nec ulla mica literarii salis, crumenimulga natio, locu telea turba litium strophe, maligna litigantium cohors togati vultures, laverne alumnae agirte, etc. End quote. Translation which have no skill with praising arrogance, no learning, such a purse-milking nation, gowned vultures, thieves, and the litigious rout of cozeners that haunt this occupation, and translation, that they cannot well tell how to live one by another, but, as he jested in the comedy of clocks, they were so many, maior pars populi arida reptant fame, they are almost starved a great part of them, and ready to devour their fellows, et noxia calidilate se coripere, such a multitude of pettifoggers and empirics, such impostors, that an honest man knows not in what sort to compose and behave himself in their society, to carry himself with credit in so vile a rout, scientiae nomen, tot sumtibus partum et vigilis, profiteri dispudiat postquam, etc., Last of all, to come to our divines, the most noble profession, and worthy of double honour, but of all others, the most distressed and miserable. If you will not believe me, hear a brief of it, as it was not many years since publicly preached at Paul's cross, by a grave minister then, and now a reverend bishop of this land. We that are bred up in learning, and destinated by our parents to this end, we suffer our childhood in the grammar school, which Augustine calls magnum tyrannidem et grave malum, and compares it to the torments of martyrdom. When we come to the university, if we live of the college allowance, as Feller is objected to the Leontines, pan ton endes plen limo kai fobu, needy of all things but hunger and fear, or if we be maintained but partly by our parents' cost, do expend in unnecessary maintenance, books and degrees, before we come to any perfection, five hundred pounds or a thousand marks. If by this price of the expense of time, our bodies and spirits, our substance and patrimonies, we cannot purchase those small rewards which are ours by law, and the right of inheritance, a poor parsonage or a vicarage of fifty pounds per annum, but we must pay to the patron for the lease of a life, a spent and outworn life, either in annual pension or above the rate of a copyhold, and that with the hazard and loss of our souls by simony and perjury and the forfeiture of all our spiritual preferments in esse and posse, both present and to come. What father, after a while, will be so improvident to bring up his son to this great charge, to this necessary beggary? What Christian will be so irreligious to bring up his son in that course of life which by all probability and necessity, cogit at turpia, and forcing to sin, will entangle him in simony and perjury, when, as the poet said, Invitatus ad haec aliquus de ponte negabit, a beggar's bread taken from the bridge where he sits a-begging, if he knew the inconvenience, had cause to refuse it. This being thus, have not we fished fair all this while, that our initiate divines, to find no better fruits of our labours? Hoc est cur palus, cur quis non prandeat hoc est? Do we macerate ourselves for this? 
Is it for this we rise so early all the year long, leaping, as he saith, out of our beds, when we hear the bell ring as if we had heard a thunderclap? If this be all the respect, reward, and honour we shall have, frange levis calamos et scinde talia libelos, let us give over our books and betake ourselves to some other cause of life. To what end should we study? Quid me literulas stulti doquere parentes? What did our parents mean to make us scholars, to be as far to seek of preferment after twenty years' study as we were at first? Why do we take such pains? Quid tantum insanes iuvat impalascere cartis? If there be no more hope of reward, no better encouragement, I say again, frange levis calamos et skinne thalia libelos. Let's turn soldiers, sell our books, and buy swords, guns, and pikes, or stop bottles with them, turn our philosopher's gowns, as Cleanthus once did, into miller's coats, leave all, and rather betake ourselves to any other cause of life than to continue longer in this misery. Prestat dentis calpea radere, quam literarius monumentis magnatum favorem emendicare. Yeah, but methinks I hear some man accept at these words, that, though this be true which I have said of the estate of scholars, and especially of divines, that it is miserable and distressed at this time, that the church suffers shipwreck of her goods, and that they have just cause to complain, there is a fault, but whence proceeds it? If the cause were justly examined, it would be retorted upon ourselves. If we were cited at that tribunal of truth, we should be found guilty, and not able to excuse it. That there is a fault among us, I confess, and were there not a buyer, there would not be a seller. But to him that will consider better of it, it will more than manifestly appear that the fountain of these miseries proceeds from these griping patrons. In accusing them, I do not altogether excuse us. Both are faulty, they and we. Yet in my judgment theirs is the greater fault, more apparent causes, and much to be condemned. For my part, if it be not with me as I would, or as it should, I do ascribe the cause, as Cardan did in the like case, meo infortunio potius quam elorum sceleri, to mine own infelicity, rather than their naughtiness. Although I have been baffled in my time by some of them, and have as just cause to complain as another, or rather, indeed, to mine own negligence, for I was ever like that Alexander in Plutarch, Crassus, his tutor in philosophy, who, though he lived many years familiarly with rich Crassus, was even as poor when from, which many wondered at, as when he came first to him. He never asked, the other never gave him anything. When he travelled with Crassus, he borrowed ahead of him, at his return restored it again. I have had some such noble friends' acquaintance, and scholars, but most part, common curtsies and ordinary respects excepted, they and I parted as we met, they gave me as much as I requested, and that was, and as Alexander ap Alexandro made answer to Hieronymus Messenus, that wondered, cum plures ignavos et ignobiles ab dignitates et sacerdotia promotos quotidie videret. When other men rose, still he was in the same state. Eodem tenore et fortuna cui mercedem laborum studiorumque deberi puteret, whom he thought to deserve as well as the rest. He made answer that he was content with his present estate, was not ambitious, and although obiurgabundus suam segnitiem accusaret cum obscure sortis homines ad sacerdotia, et pontificatus, evectos, etc., he chid him for his backwardness, yet he was still the same, and for my part, though I be not worthy perhaps to carry Alexander's books, yet by some overweening and well-wishing friends the like speeches have been used to me. But I replied still with Alexander that I had enough, and more peradventure than I deserved, and with Libanius Sophista, that rather chose when honours and offices by the emperor were offered unto him, to be talis sophista quam talis magistratus. I had as lief be still Democritus junior, and privus privatus, si mihi jam daretur optio, quam talis fortasse doctor, talis dominus, said corsum haec. For the rest, tis on both sides facunus detestandum, 
to buy and sell livings, to detain from the church that which God's and men's laws have bestowed on it, but in them most, and that from the covetousness and ignorance of such as are interested in this business. I named covetousness in the first place, as the root of all these mischiefs, which, Achan-like, compels them to commit sacrilege, and to make simoniacal compacts, and what not to their own ends, that kindles God's wrath, brings a plague, vengeance, and a heavy visitation upon themselves and others. Some, out of that insatiable desire of filthy lucre, to be enriched, care not how they come by it, per fas et nefas, hook or crook, so they have it. And others, when they have with riot and prodigality embezzled their estates, to recover themselves, make a prey of the church, robbing it, as Julian the Apostate did, spoil parsons of their revenues, in keeping half back, as a great man amongst us observes, and that maintenance on which they should live, by means whereof barbarism is increased, and a great decay of Christian professors. For who will apply himself to these divine studies, his son or friend, when after great pains taken, they shall have nothing whereupon to live? But with what event do they these things? Opesque totis viribus venamini, at innemesis accidit miserima. They toil and moil, but what reap they? They are commonly unfortunate families that use it, a curse in their progeny, and, as common experience evinced, a curse themselves in all their proceedings. With what face, as he quotes out of Ost, can they expect a blessing or inheritance from Christ in heaven, that defraud Christ of his inheritance here on earth? I would all our simoniacal patrons, and such as detain tithes, would read those judicious tracts of Sir Henry Spellman and Sir James Sempel, knights, those late elaborate and learned treatises of Dr. Tilsley and Mr. Montague, which they have written of that subject. But, though they should read, it would be to small purpose, clamus licet et mare coelo confundas, thunder, lighten, preach hell and damnation, tell them tis a sin, they will not believe it, denounce and terrify, they have cauterized consciences, they do not attend, as the enchanted edder, they stop their ears, call them base, irreligious, profane, barbarous, pagans, atheists, epicures, as some of them surely are, with the bawd in plautus, huge, optime, they cry and applaud themselves with that miser, simul ac numus contemplor in arca, say what you will, conque modo rem, as a dog barks at the moon, to no purpose are your sayings. Take your heaven, let them have money. A base, profane, epicurean, hypocritical rout. For my part, let them pretend what zeal they will, counterfeit religion, blear the world's eyes, bombast themselves, and stuff out their greatness with church spoils, shine like so many peacocks. So cold is my charity, so defective in this behalf, that I shall never think better of them than that they are rotten at core, their bones are full of epicurean hypocrisy, and atheistical marrow, they are worse than heathens. For, as Dionysius Halicarnassius observes, Antiquitatis Romane, Book 7, Primum Locum, etc., Greeks and barbarians observe all religious rites, and dare not break them for fear of offending their gods. But our simoniacal contractors, our senseless achans, our stupefied patrons, fear neither God nor devil, they have evasions for it, it is no sin, or not due jure divino, or if a sin, no great sin, etc. And though they be daily punished for it, and they do manifestly perceive that, as he said, frost and fraud come to foul ends, Yet, as Chrysostom follows it, nulla expuna sit correctio, et quasi adversis malitia hominum provocetur, crescit quotidie quot puniatur, they are rather worse than better. Iram atque animos a crimine sumunt. And the more they are corrected, the more they offend. But let them take their course, rode caper vites, go on still as they begin, tis no sin, let them rejoice secure, God's vengeance will overtake them in the end, and these ill-gotten goods, as an eagle's feathers, will consume the rest of their substance. It is aurum tolusanum, and will produce no better effects. 
let them lay it up safe, and make their conveyances never so close. Lock and shut door, said Chrysostom, yet fraud and covetousness, two most violent thieves, are still included, and a little gain evil gotten will subvert the rest of their goods. The eagle and Aesop, seeing a piece of flesh now ready to be sacrificed, swept it away with her claws, and carried it to her nest. But there was a burning coal stuck to it by chance, which unawares consumed her young ones, nest and all together. Let our simoniocal church-chopping patrons and sacrilegious harpies look for no better success. End of section 39section forty of the anatomy of melancholy volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by anna simon the anatomy of melancholy volume one by robert burton section forty petition one section two member three subsection fifteen part three love of learning or overmuch study with a digression of the misery of scholars, and why the muses are melancholy, continued. A second cause is ignorance, and from thence contempt, successit odium in literas ab ignorantia vulgi, which Junius well perceived. This hatred and contempt of learning proceeds out of ignorance, as they are themselves barbarous, idiots, dull, illiterate, and proud, so they esteem of others. Sint me canatus non deerunt flacce marones. Let there be bountiful patrons, and there will be painful scholars in all sciences. But when they contemn learning, and think themselves sufficiently qualified, if they can read and write, scramble at a piece of evidence, or have so much Latin as that emperor had, qui nescit dissimulare nescit vive, they are unfit to do their country's service, to perform or undertake any action or employment which may tend to the good of a commonwealth, except it be to fight, or to do country justice, with common sense, which every yeoman can likewise do. And so they bring up their children, rude as they are themselves, unqualified, untaught, uncivil most part. Quis e nostra juventute legitime instituetur literis? quis oratores aut philosophus tangit, quis historiam legit illam rerum agendarum quasi animam, precipitant parentes vota sua, etc. Twas Lipsius complained to his illiterate countrymen, it may be ours. Now shall these men judge of a scholar's worth that have no worth, that know not what belongs to a student's labours, that cannot distinguish between a true scholar and a drone, or him that by reason of a voluble tongue, a strong voice, a pleasing tone, and some trivially polyanthian helps, steals and gleans a few notes from other men's harvests, and so makes a fairer show than he that is truly learned indeed, that thinks it no more to preach than to speak, or to run away with an empty cart, as a grave man said, and thereupon vilify us and our pains, scorn us and all learning, because they are rich and have other means to live, they think it concerns them not to know, or to trouble themselves with it, a fitter task for younger brothers or poor men's sons, to be pen and inkhorn men, pedantical slaves, and no wit beseeming the calling of a gentleman, as Frenchmen and Germans commonly do, neglect therefore all human learning, what have they to do with it? Let mariners learn astronomy, merchants, factors, study arithmetic, Surveyors get them geometry, spectacle-makers optics, land-leapers geography, town-clerks rhetoric. What should he do with a spade that had no ground to dig, or they with learning that have no use of it? Thus they reason, and are not ashamed to let mariners, apprentices, and the basest servants be better qualified than themselves. In former times, Kings, princes, and emperors were the only scholars, excellent in all faculties. Julius Caesar mended the year, and read his own commentaries. Media inter prealia semper, stellarum solique plagis superisque vacavit. 
Antonius, Adrian, Nero, etc., Michael the Emperor, and Isaacius, were so much given to their studies that no base fellow would take so much pains. Orion, Perseus, Alphonsus, Ptolemaeus, famous astronomers, Saber, Mithridates, Lysimachus, admired physicians, Plato's kings all, Evax, that Arabian prince, a most expert jeweller and an exquisite philosopher. The kings of Egypt were priests of old, chosen and from thence, idem rex hominum, phoebique sacerdos. But those heroical times are past. The muses are now banished in this bastard age, ad sordida tugoriola, to meaner persons, and confined alone almost to universities. In those days scholars were highly beloved, honoured, esteemed, as old Aeneas by Scipio Africanus, Virgil by Augustus, Horace by Messenus, princes' companions, dear to them as Anacreon to Polycrates, Philoxenus to Dionysius, and highly rewarded. Alexander sent Xenocrates, the philosopher, fifty talents, because he was poor. Visu rerum aut eruditionem prestantes viri, menses olem regum adhibiti. As Philostratus relates of Adrian and Lampridius of Alexander Severus, famous clerks came to these princes' courts, velut in lyceum, as to a university, and were admitted to their tables, quasi divum epulis axubentes. Archelaus, that Macedonian king, would not willingly sup without Euripides. Amongst the rest he drank to him at supper one night, and gave him a cup of gold for his pains. Delectatus poetae suavi sermone. And it was fit it should be so, because, as Plato in his Protagoras well saith, a good philosopher as much excels other men as a great king doth the commons of his country, and again, Quoniam illis nihil deest, et minime eger solent, et disciplinas quas profitentur, soli a contemptu vindicare possunt. They needed not to beg so basely, as they compel scholars in our times to complain of poverty, or crouch to a rich chuff for a meal's meat, but could vindicate themselves and those arts which they professed. Now they would and cannot, for it is held by some of them as an axiom that to keep them poor will make them study. They must be dieted, as horses to a race, not pampered. Alendos volunt, non saginandos, ne melioris mentis flamula extinguatur. A fat bird will not sing, a fat dog cannot hunt, and so by this depression of theirs some want means, others will, all want encouragement, as being forsaken almost, and generally contempt. Tis an old saying, Sint me senatus, non deon flacca maronis, and tis a true saying still. Yet, oftentimes, I may not deny it, the main fault is in ourselves. Our academics too frequently offend in neglecting patrons, as Erasmus well taxed, or making ill choice of them. Ne glicimus oblatos aut amplectimo parum aptos or, if we get a good one, non studemus mutuis officiis favorem eius alere. We do not ply and follow him as we should. Idem he accedit adolescenti, saith Erasmus, acknowledging his fault, et gravissime pacavi. And so may I say myself, I have offended in this, and so peradventure have many others. We did not spondere magnatum favoribus qui perunt nos amplecti, apply ourselves with that readiness we should, idleness, love of liberty, immodicus amor libertatis effecit ut dio cum perfidis amicis, as he confesseth, et pertinaci pauperate colluctare, bashfulness, melancholy, timorousness, cause many of us to be too backward and remiss. So some offend in one extreme, but too many on the other. We are most part too forward, too solicitous, too ambitious, too impudent. We commonly complain, dea semisenatis, of want of encouragement, want of means, when as the true defect is in our own want of worth, our insufficiency. Did Messenas take notice of Horace or Virgil, till they had shown themselves first? Or had Bavius and Mavius any patrons? 
Egregium specimen dent, saith Erasmus, let them improve themselves worthy first, sufficiently qualified for learning and manners, before they presume or impudently intrude and put themselves on great men as too many do, with such base flattery, parasitical colloguing, such hyperbolical elegies they do usually insinuate that it is a shame to hear and see. Emodicae laudes conciliant invidiam, potius quam laudem. And vain commendations derogate from truth, and we think in conclusion, non melius de laudato, peius de laudante, ill of both, the commander and commanded. So we offend, but the main fault is in their harshness, defect of patrons. How beloved of old, and how much respected, was Plato to Dionysius! How dear to Alexander was Aristotle, Demaratus to Philip, Solon to Crusus, Arxarxus and Trebasius to Augustus, Cassius to Vespasian, Plutarch to Trajan, Seneca to Nero, Simonides to Hieron, how honoured! Set haec prios fuere nunc recondita senent quiete. Those days are gone. Et spes et ratio studiorum in Caesar tantum, as he said of old, we may truly say now, he is our amulet, our son, our sole comfort and refuge, our Ptolemy, our common Messinus, Jacobus Munificus, Jacobus Pacificus, Mista Musarum, Rex Platonicus, Grande Decus, Columenque Nostrum. A famous scholar himself, and the sole patron, pillar, and sustainer of learning, but his worth in this kind is so well known, that as Patroclus of Cato, Yam ipsum laudare nefas sit, and which Pliny to Trajan, Seria te carmina, honorque eternus analium, non haec brevis et pudenda predicatio colet. But he is now gone, the sun of ours set, and yet no night follows, sol oxubuit nox nulla sequita est, we have such another in his room, Aureus Alter, Avulsus, simili frondescit firga metallo, and long may he reign and flourish amongst us. Let me not be malicious and lie against my genius, I may not deny, but that we have a sprinkling of our gentry here and there one, excellently well learned, like those fuggery in Germany, du Bartu, du Plessis, Sadel, in France. Picus Mirandula, Scotus, Barotius, in Italy, Apparent rari nantes in gurgite vasto, But they are but few in respect of the multitude, The major part, and some again excepted, that are indifferent, Are wholly bent for hawks and hounds, And carried away many times with intemperate lust, Gaming and drinking. If they read a book at any time, Si quod est interim otii ad venitu, Poculus, Alea, Scortis. Tis an English chronicle, St. Juan of Bordeaux, Amadis de Gaulle, etc., a playbook, or some pamphlet of news, and that at such seasons only, when they cannot stir abroad, to drive away time. Their sole discourse is dogs, hawks, horses, and what news. If some one have been a traveller in Italy, or as far as the Emperor's court, wintered in Orléans, and can court his mistress in broken French, Wear his clothes neatly in the newest fashion, Sing some choice outlandish tunes, Discourse of lords, ladies, towns, palaces and cities, He is complete and to be admired. Otherwise he and they are much at one. No difference between the master and the man, But worshipful titles. Wink and choose betwixt him that sits down, Clothes accepted, and him that holds the trencher behind him, Yet these men must be our patrons, our governors too sometimes, statesmen, magistrates, noble, great, and wise by inheritance. Mistake me not, I say again, vos o patricius sanguis, you that are worthy senators, gentlemen, I honour your names and persons, and with all submissiveness prostrate myself to your censure and service. There are amongst you, I do ingeniously confess, many well-deserving patrons, and two patriots, of my knowledge, besides many hundreds which I never saw, no doubt, or heard of, pillars of our commonwealth, whose worth, bounty, learning, forwardness, true zeal in religion, 
and good esteem of all scholars, ought to be consecrated to all posterity. But of your rank there are a debauched, corrupt, covetous, illiterate crew again, no better than stocks, meum pecus, testor deum non mihi videri dignos ingenui hominis appellationi, barbarous Thracians, et quis ille thrax qui hoc neget, a sordid, profane, pernicious company, irreligious, impudent, and stupid, I know not what epithets to give them, enemies to learning, confounders of the church, and the ruin of a commonwealth, patrons they are, by right of inheritance, and put in trust freely to dispose of such livings to the church's good, but, hard taskmasters they prove, they take away their straw, and compel them to make their number of brick, they commonly respect their own ends, commodity is the steer of all their actions, and him they present in conclusion as a man of greatest gifts that will give most, no penny, no pater noster, as the saying is, nisi precas auro fucias, amplius iritas, ut kerberus offa, their attendants and officers must be bribed, feed, and made, as Cerberus is, with a sop, by him that goes to hell. It was an old saying, omnia Rome venalia, all things are venal at Rome, this is a rag of popery which will never be rooted out. There is no hope, no good to be done without money. A clerk may offer himself, approve his worth, learning, honesty, religion, zeal, they will commend him for it. But probidas laudatur et alget. If he be a man of extraordinary parts, they will flock afar off to hear him, as they did in Apuleius, to see Psyche. Multi mortales confluebant ad videndum seculi decus, speculum gloriosum, laudator ab omnibus, spectator ob omnibus, nec quisquam non rex, non regius, cupidis eus nuptiarium petitor accedit, mirantur quidem divinam foram omnes, set ut simulacrum fabro politum mirantur. Many mortal men came to see fair Psyche, the glory of her age, they did admire her, commend, desire her for her divine beauty, and gaze upon her, but as on a picture. None would marry her, quot in dotato, fair Psyche had no money. So they do by learning. Didicit jam dives avarus, tantum admirari, tantum laudare disertos, ut pueri junonis avem. Your rich men have now learned of latter days to admire, commend, and come together, to hear and see a worthy scholar speak, as children do a peacock's feather. He shall have all the good words that may be given, a proper man, and his pity he hath no preferment, all good wishes, but inexorable, injured as he is, he will not prefer him, though it be in his power, because he is indotatus, he hath no money. Or if he do give him entertainment, let him be never so well qualified, plead affinity, consanguinity, sufficiency. He shall serve seven years, as Jacob did for Rachel, before he shall have it. If he will enter at first, he must get in at that simoniacal gate, come off soundly, and put in good security to perform all covenants, else he will not deal with or admit him. But if some poor scholar, some parson chaff, will offer himself— some trencher chaplain that will take it to the halves, thirds, or accepts of what he will give, he is welcome. Be conformable, preach as he will have him, he likes him before a million of others, for the host is always best cheap, and then, as Hiram said to Crematius, Patella dignum operculum, such a patron, such a clerk, the cure is well supplied, and all parties pleased, so that is still verified in our age, which Chrysostom complained of in his time, qui opulentiorus sunt in ordinem parasitorum cogunt eos, et ipsos tanquam canes ad mensas suas enutriunt, erumco impudentes. Veneris iniquarum coenarum reliquiis diversiunt, isdem pro arbitro abulentes. Rich men keep these lecturers, and fawning parasites, like so many dogs at their tables, and filling their hungry guts with the offals of their meat, they abuse them at their pleasure, and make them say what they propose. As children do by a bird or a butterfly in a string, pull in and let him out as they list, do they by their trencher chaplains, prescribe, command their wits, let in and out as to them it seems best. 
If the patron be precise, so must his chaplain be. If he be perpestical, his clerk must be so too, or else be turned out. These are those clerks which serve the turn, whom they commonly entertain and present to church livings, whilst in the meantime we that are university men, like so many hidebound calves in a pasture, tarry out our time, wither away as a flower ungathered in a garden, and are never used, or as so many candles illuminate ourselves alone, obscuring one another's light, and are not discerned here at all, the least of which, translated to a dark room, or to some country benefice, where it might shine apart, would give a fair light, and be seen over all. Whilst we lie waiting here, as those sick men did at the pool of Bethesda, till the angels stirred the water, expecting a good hour, they step between, and beguile us of our preferment. I have not yet said, if after long expectation, much expense, travel, earnest suit of ourselves and friends, we obtain a small benefice at last. Our misery begins afresh. We are suddenly encountered with the flesh, world, and devil, with a new onset. We change a quiet life for an ocean of troubles. We come to a ruinous house, which before it be habitable, must be necessarily to our great damage repaired. We are compelled to sue for dilapidations, or else sued ourselves, and scarce yet settled we are called upon for our predecessors' arrearages. First fruits, tenths, subsidies, are instantly to be paid, benevolence, procreations, etc., and which is most to be feared, we light upon a cracked title, as it befell Clannard of Brabant, for his rectory, in charge of his begine. He was no sooner inducted, but instantly sued. Capimusque, saith he, strenue litigare, et implacabili bello confligere. At length, after ten years' suit, as long as Troy's siege, when he had tired himself and spent his money, he was fain to leave all for quietness' sake, and give it up to his adversary. Or else we are insulted over, and trampled on by domineering officers, fleeced by those greedy harpies to get more fees, we stand in fear of some precedent lapse, we fall amongst refractory, seditious sectaries, peevish puritans, perverse papists, a lascivious rout of atheistical epicures that will not be reformed, or some litigious people, those wild beasts of Ephesus, must be fought with, that will not pay their dues without much repining, or compelled by long suit. Laici clericis opido infesti, an old axiom, all they think well gotten, that is had from the church, and by such uncivil harsh dealings, they make their poor minister weary of his place, if not his life, and put case they be quiet honest men, make the best of it, as often it falls out, from a polite and terse academic, he must turn rustic, rude, melancholize alone, learn to forget, or else, as many do, become maltsters, graziers, chapmen, etc., now banished from the academy, all commerce of the muses, and confined to a country village, as Ovid was from Rome to Pontus, and daily converse with a company of idiots and clowns. End of section 40《ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャストの番組を始めます。ポッドキャ Non necessary, remote, outward, adventitious, or accidental causes, as first from the nurse. Of those remote, outward, ambient, necessary causes, I have sufficiently discoursed in the precedent member. The non necessary follow, of which, saith Fucius, no art can be made by reason of their uncertainty, casualty, and multitude. So called not necessarily because according to Fernelius they may be avoided. And used without necessity. Many of these accidental causes, which I shall entreat of here, might have well been reduced to the former, because they cannot be avoided, but fatally happen to us, though accidentally and unawares, at some time or other. The rest are contingent and inevitable, and more properly inserted in this rank of causes. To reckon up all is a thing impossible. 
Of some, therefore, most remarkable of these contingent causes which produce melancholy, I will speak briefly and in their order. From a child's nativity, the first ill accident that can likely befall him in this kind is a bad nurse, by whose means alone he may be tainted with this malady from his cradle. Aulus Gellius, Book 2, Chapter 1, brings in Favorinus, that eloquent philosopher, proving this at large, that there is the same virtue and prosperity in the milk as in the seed, and not in men alone, but in all other creatures. He gives instance in a kid and lamb. If either of them suck of the other's milk, the lamb of the goats, and the kid of the ewes, the wool of the one will be hard, and the hair of the other soft. Giraldus Cambrensis confirms this by a notable example which happened in his time. A sow-pig by chance sucked a brach, and when she was grown would miraculously hunt all manner of deer, and that as well, or rather better, than any ordinary hound. His conclusion is that men and beasts participate of her nature and conditions by whose milk they are fed. Favorinus urges it farther, and demonstrates it more evidently that if a nurse be misshapen, unchaste, dishonest, impudent, cruel, or the like, the child that sucks upon her breast will be so too. All other affections of the mind and diseases are almost engrafted, as it were, and imprinted into the temperature of the infant by the nurse's milk, as pox, leprosy, melancholy, etc. Cato, for some such reason, would make his servant's children suck upon his wife's breast, because by that means they would love him and his the better and in all likelihood agree with them. A more evident example that the minds are altered by milk cannot be given than that of Dion, which he relates of Caligula's cruelty. It could neither be imputed to father nor mother, but to his cruel nurse alone, that anointed her paps with blood still when he sucked, which made him such a murderer, and to express her cruelty to a hair, and that of Tiberius, who was a common drunkard, because his nurse was such a one. Et si delira fuet, one observes, in pantulum delirum faciet. If she be a fool or dolt, the child she nurseth will take after her, or otherwise be misaffected, which Franciscus Barbarus proves at full, and Antonius Grivara, book two de Marco Aurelio, the child will surely participate. For bodily sickness there is no doubt to be made. Titus, Vespasian's son, was therefore sickly, because the nurse was so, Lampridius. And if we may believe physicians, many times children catch the pox from a bad nurse, Bortaldus. Besides evil attendance, negligence, and many gross inconveniences, which are incident to nurses, much danger may so come to the child. For these causes, Aristotle, Politics, Book 7, Chapter 17. Favorinus and Marcus Aurelius would not have a child put to nurse at all, but every mother to bring up her own, of what condition soever she be. For a sound and able mother to put out her child to nurse, is natura in temperies, so grasped so calls it. Tis fit, therefore, she should be nurse herself. The mother will be more careful, loving, and attendant, than any servile woman or such hard creatures. This all the world acknowledgeth. Convenientissimum est as Rodericus a Castro de Natura Mulierum, Book 4, Chapter 12, in many words confesseth. Matrum ipsum lactare infantum. It is most fit that the mother should suckle her own infant, who denies that it should be so, and which some women most curiously observe, among the rest, that Queen of France, a Spaniard of, by birth, that was so precise and zealous in this behalf, that when in her absence a strange nurse had suckled her child, she was never quiet till she had made the infant vomit it up again. But she was too jealous. If it be so, as many times it is, they must be put forth, the mother is not fit or well able to be a nurse, I would then advise such mothers, as Plutarch does in his book De Liberis Educandis, and Sanctus Hieronymus, Book 2, Epistle 27, Magninus and the said Rodericus, that they make choice of a sound woman, of a good complexion, honest, free from bodily diseases, if it be possible, all passions and perturbations of the mind, as sorrow, fear, grief, folly, melancholy. For such passions corrupt the milk, and alter the temperature of the child, which, now being udum et molle lutum, a moist and soft clay, is easily seasoned and perverted. And if such a nurse may be found out, 
that will be diligent and careful withal, let Favorinus and Marcus Aurelius plead how they can against it. I had rather accept of her in some cases than the mother herself, and which Bonarchialis, the physician, Biesius, the politician, approves. Some nurses are much to be preferred to some mothers. For why may not the mother be naught, a peevish drunken flirt, a waspish choleric slut, a crazed piece, a fool, as many mothers are, unsound as soon as the nurse? There is more choice of nurses than mothers, and therefore except the mother be most virtuous, staid, a woman of excellent good parts, and of a sound complexion, I would have all children in such cases committed to discreet strangers. And tis the only way, as by marriage they are engrafted to another families, to alter the breed, or if anything be amiss in the mother, as Ludovicus Mercatus contends, to prevent diseases and future maladies, to correct and qualify the child's ill-disposed temperature which he had from his parents. This is an excellent remedy if good choice be made of such a nurse. Subsection 2. Education a cause of melancholy. Education of these accidental causes of melancholy may justly challenge the next place, for if a man escape a bad nurse, he may be undone by evil bringing up. Jason Pratensis puts this of education for a principal cause, bad parents, stepmothers, tutors, masters, teachers, too rigorous, too severe, too remiss or indulgent on the other side, are often fountains and furtherers of this disease. Parents and such as have the tuition and oversight of children offend many times in that they are too stern, always threatening, chiding, brawling, whipping, or striking, by means of which their poor children are so disheartened and cowed that they never after have any courage, a merry hour in their lives, or take pleasure in anything. There is a great moderation to be had in such things, as matters of so great moments at to the making or marring of a child. Some fight their children with beggars, bugbears, and hobgoblins, if they cry, or be otherwise unruly, but they are much to blame in it. Many times, saith Lavata, Dispectris, Part 1, Chapter 5, Ex metu in morbus graves incident, et noctu dormientes clament, for fear they fall into many diseases, and cry out in their sleep, and are much the worse for it all their lives. These things ought not at all or to be sparingly done, and upon just occasion. Tyrannical, impatient, hare-brained schoolmasters, Aridi magistri, so Fabius terms them, Ajaces flagelliferi, are in this kind as bad as hangmen and executioners. They make many children endure a martyrdom all the while they are at school, with bad diet, if they board in their houses, too much severity and ill usage. They quite pervert their temperature of body and mind, still chiding, railing, frowning, lashing, tasking, keeping, that they are fracti animis, moped many times, weary of their lives, nimia severitate deficient et desperant, and think no slavery in the world, as once I did myself, like to that of a grammar scholar. Praeceptorum ineptiis discruciantur ingenia puerorum, saith Erasmus, they tremble at his voice, looks, coming in, St. Augustine, in the first book of his Confessions, calls this schooling meliculosum necessitatum, and elsewhere a martyrdom, and confesseth of himself how cruelly he was tortured in mind for learning Greek. Nulla verba noverum, et saevis terroribus et puinis, ut nosum instantabur mihi vehementa. I know nothing, and with cruel terrors and punishment I was daily compelled. Beza complains in like case of a rigorous schoolmaster in Paris that made him by his continual thunder and threats once in a mind to drown himself, had he not met by the way with an uncle of his that vindicated him from that misery for the time by taking him to his house. Trincavelius had a patient, nineteen years of age, extremely melancholy, ob nimium studium, tarvitii et preceptoris minus, by reason of overmuch study and his tutor's threats. Many masters are hard-hearted and bitter to their servants, and by that means do so deject, with terrible speeches and hard usage so crucify them, that they become desperate, and can never be recalled. Others again, in that opposite extreme, do as great harm by their too much remissness. They give them no bringing up, no calling to busy themselves about, or to live in, 
teach them no trade, or set them in any good course, by means of which their servants, children, scholars, are carried away with that stream of drunkenness, idleness, gaming, and many such irregular courses, that in the end they rue it, curse their parents, and mischief themselves. Too much indulgence causeth the like, inepta patris lenitas at facilitas prava, when, as mitio like with too much liberty and too great allowance, they feed their children's humours, let them revel, wench, riot, swagger, and do what they will themselves, and then punish them with a the noise of musicians. Obsonet, potet, oliat unguenta de meo, amat, dabito ami argentum ubi erit commodum, fores effregit, restituenta, descidit, vestem, resarcietur, Faciat quod lubet, sumat, consumat, perdat, decretum est parti. But, as Demeo told him, To illum corrumpi sinis, your lenity will be his undoing. Previderi video jam diem, illum, cum hic egens profugiet aliquo militatum. I foresee his ruin. So parents often err, many fond mothers especially, dote so much upon their children, like Aesop's ape, till in the end they crush them to death. Corporum nutrices animarum noverce, pampering up their bodies to the undoing of their souls. They will not let them be corrected or controlled, but still soothed up in everything they do, that in conclusion they bring sorrow, shame, heaviness to their parents. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 30, 8, 9. Become wanton, stubborn, willful, and disobedient, rude, untaught, headstrong, incorrigible, and graceless. They love them so foolishly, says Cardan, that they rather seem to hate them, bringing them not up to virtue but injury, not to learning but to riot, not to sober life and conversation, but to all pleasure and licentious behaviour. Who is he of so little experience that knows not this of Fabius to be true? Education is another nature, altering the mind and will, and I would to God, saith he, we ourselves did not spoil our children's manners by our overmuch cockering and nice education and weaken the strength of their bodies and minds, that causeth custom, custom, nature, etc. For these causes, Plutarch in his book, De Liberis Educandis, and Hieronymus, gives a most especial charge to all parents, and many good cautions about bringing up of children, that they be not committed to indiscreet, passionate, bedlam tutors, light, giddy-headed, or covetous persons, and spare for no cost, that they may be well nurtured and taught, it being a matter of so great consequence. For such parents as do otherwise, Plutarch esteems of them that are more careful of their shoes than of their feet, that rate their wealth above their children. And he, says Cardan, that leaves his son to a covetous schoolmaster to be informed, or to a close abbey to fast and learn wisdom together, doth no other than that he be a learned fool, or a sickly wise man. End of section 41《Section 42 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 by Robert Burton, Section 42. Partition 1, Section 2, Member 4, Subsections 3 and 4. Subsection 3. Terrors and Affrights, Causes of Melancholy. Tully, in the fourth of his Tusculans, distinguishes these terrors which arise from the apprehension of some terrible object heard or seen, from other fears, and so doth Patritius. Lib. 5, Tit. 4, De Regis Institute. Of all fears they are most pernicious and violent, and so suddenly alter the whole temperature of the body, move the soul and spirits, strike such a deep impression that the parties can never be recovered, causing more grievous and fiercer melancholy, as Felix Plater speaks out of his experience, than any inward cause whatsoever, and imprints itself so forcibly in the spirits, brain, humours, that if all the mass of blood were let out of the body, it could hardly be extracted. This horrible kind of melancholy, for so he terms it, had been often brought before him, 
and troubles and affrights commonly men and women, young and old of all sorts. Hercules de Saxonia calls this kind of melancholy, ab agitatione spirituum, by a peculiar name. It comes from the agitation, motion, contraction, dilation of spirits, not from any distemperature of humours, and produceth strong effects. This terror is most usually caused, as Plutarch will have, from some imminent danger, when a terrible object is at hand, heard, seen, or conceived, truly appearing, or in a dream, and many times the more sudden the accident, it is the more violent. Stat terror animis, et co atonitum salit, pavidunque trepidis palpitat venis jecur. Their souls affright, their heart amazed quakes, the trembling liver pants in the veins, and aches. Arthemodorus the grammarian lost his wits by the unexpected sight of a crocodile. Laurentius. The massacre at Lyon, 1572, in the reign of Charles the Nine, was so terrible and fearful that many ran mad. Some died. Great-bellied women were brought to bed before their time, generally all affrighted aghast. Many lose their wits by the sudden sight of some spectrum or devil, a thing very common in all ages, saith Lavater, part 1, chapter 9, as Orestes did at the sight of the Furies, which appeared to him in black, as Pausanias records. The Greeks call them Momolycaea, which so terrify their souls, or if they be but affrighted by some counterfeit devils in jest, ut pueri trepidant, atque omnia caecis, in tenebris metuunt, as children in the dark conceive hobgoblins, and are so afraid, they are the worst for it all their lives. Some by sudden fires, earthquakes, inundations, or any such dismal objects. Themiscon, the physician, fell into a hydrophobia, by seeing one sick of that disease. Dioscorides, Book 6, Chapter 33. Or by the sight of a monster, a carcass, they are disquieted many months following, and cannot endure the room where a corpse hath been. For a world would not be alone with a dead man, or lie in that bed many years after in which a man hath died. At Basel, many little children in the springtime went to gather flowers in a meadow at the town's end, where a malefactor hung in gibbets. All gazing at it, one by chance flung a stone, and made it stir. By which accident, the children affrighted ran away. One slower than the rest looked back, and seeing the stirred carcass wagged towards her, cried out it came after her, and was so terribly affrighted that for many days she could not rest, eat, or sleep. She could not be pacified, but melancholy died. In the same town another child, beyond the Rhine, saw a grave opened, and upon the sight of a carcass was so troubled in mind that she could not be comforted, but a little after departed, and was buried by it. Platerus Observationes, Book 1 a gentlewoman of the same city saw a fat hog cut up. When the entrails were opened, and a noisome savour offended her nose, she much misliked, and would not longer abide. A physician in presence told her, as that hog, so was she, full of filthy excrements, and aggravated the matter by some other loathsome instances, insomuch this nice gentlewoman apprehended it so deeply that she fell forthwith a vomiting was so mightily distempered in mind and body, that with all his art and persuasions, for some months after, he could not restore her to herself again. She could not forget it, or remove the object out of her sight. Idem. Many cannot endure to see a wound opened, but they are offended. A man executed, or labour of any fearful disease, as possession, apoplexies, one bewitched, or if they read by chance of some terrible thing, the symptoms alone of such a disease, or that which they dislike, they are instantly troubled in mind, aghast, ready to apply it to themselves. They are as much disquieted as if they had seen it, or were so affected themselves. Hecatus sibi videntur somniare. They dream, and continually think of it. As lamentable effects are caused by such terrible objects heard, read, or seen, auditus maximus mortis in corpore facit, as Plutarch holds, no sense makes greater alteration of body and mind. Sudden speech sometimes, unexpected news, be they good or bad, previsa minus oratio, will move as much, animum obrure, et de seda sua dejicere, as a philosopher observes, 
will take away our sleep and appetite, disturb and quite overturn us. Let them bear witness that have heard these tragical alarms, outcries, hideous noises, which are many times suddenly heard in the dead of the night by eruption of enemies and accidental fires, etc. Those panic fears, which often drive men out of their wits, bereave them of sense, understanding and all, some for a time, some for their whole lives. They never recover it. The Midianites were so affrighted by Gideon's soldiers, they breaking but every one a pitcher, and Hannibal's army by such a panic fear was discomfited at the walls of Rome. Augusta Livia, hearing a few tragical verses recited out of Virgil, to Marcellus Eris, etc., fell down dead in a swoon. Edinus, king of Denmark, by a sudden sound which he heard, was turned into fury with all his men. Cranzius. Amatus Lusitanius had a patient that by reason of bad tidings became epilepticus. Cardan de substilitate rerum, book 18, saw one that lost his wits by mistaking of an echo. If one sense alone can cause such violent commotions of the mind, what may we think when hearing, sight, and those other senses are all troubled at once, as by some earthquakes, thunder, lightning, tempests, etc.? At Bologna in Italy, anno 1504, there was such a fearful earthquake about eleven o'clock in the night, as Beroaldus in his book De Terra Motu has commended to posterity, that all the city trembled. The people thought the world was at an end, actum de mortalibus, such a fearful noise, it made such a detestable smell, the inhabitants were infinitely affrighted, and some ran mad. Audi rem atrocum et analibus memorandum, mine author adds, here a strange story, and worthy to be chronicled. I had a servant at the time called Fulco Argelanus, a bold and proper man, so grievously terrified with it, that he was first melancholy, after doted, at last mad, and made away with himself. At Foscinum in Japona there was such an earthquake, and darkness on a sudden, that many men were offended with headache, many overwhelmed with sorrow and melancholy. At Mayacum whole streets and goodly palaces were overturned at the same time, and there was such a hideous noise withal, like thunder, and filthy smell, that their hair stared for fear, and their hearts quaked, men and beasts were incredibly terrified. In Sakai, another city, the same earthquake was so terrible unto them, that many were bereft of their senses, and others, by that horrible spectacle so much amazed, that they knew not what they did. Blasius, a Christian, the reporter of the news, was so affrighted for his part, that though it were two months after, he was scarce his own man. Neither could he drive the remembrance of it out of his mind. Many times, some years following, they will tremble afresh at the remembrance or conceit of such a terrible object, even all their lives long, if mention be made of it. Cornelius Agrippa relates out of Guilliemus Parisiensis a story of one, that after a distasteful purge which a physician had prescribed unto him, was so much moved that at the very sight of physic he would be distempered, though he never so much as smelled to it. The box of physic long after would give him a purge, nay, the very remembrance of it did affect it. Like travellers and seamen, saith Plutarch, that when they have been sanded or dashed on a rock, for ever after, fear not that mischance only, but all such dangers whatsoever. Subsection 4. Scoffs, calumnies, bitter jests, how they cause melancholy. It is an old saying, a blow with a word strikes deeper than a blow with a sword, and many men are as much galled with a calumny, a scurrilous and bitter jest, a libel, a pasquil, satire, apologue, epigram, stage play, or the like, as with any misfortune whatsoever. Princes and potentates, that are otherwise happy, and have all at command, secure and free, quibus potentia sclerus impunitatum fecit, are grievously vexed with these pasquiling libels and satires. They fear a railing Aretine more than an enemy in the field, which made most princes of his time, as some relate, allow him a liberal pension, that he should not tax them in his satires. The gods had their Momus, Homer his Zoilus, Achilles his Thersites, Philip his Demodes, the Caesars themselves in Rome were commonly taunted. There was never wanting a Petronius, a Lucian in those times, nor will be a Rabelais, a Euphormio, a Boccalinus in ours. Adrian the sixth pope was so highly offended, and grievously vexed with Pasquillas at Rome, he gave command that his statue should be demolished and burned, the ashes flung into the river Tiber, and had done it forthwith, 
had not Ludovicus Thresanus, a facete companion, dissuaded him to the contrary, by telling him that Pasquil's ashes would turn to frogs in the bottom of the river, and croak worse and louder than before, genus irritabili vatum, and therefore Socrates in Plato aviseth all his friends that respect their credits, to stand in awe of poets, for they are terrible fellows, can praise and dispraise as they see cause. Hinc quam sit calamus savior ense patet. The prophet David complains, Psalm 123, 4, that his soul was full of the mocking of the wealthy, and of the despitefulness of the proud, and Psalm level 4, for the voice of the wicked, etc., and their hate. His heart trembled within him, and the terrors of death came upon him, fear and horrible fear, etc., and Psalm 69, 20, Rebuke hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. Who hath not like cause to complain, and is not so troubled, that shall fall into the mouths of such men? For many are of so petulant a spleen, and have that figure sarcasmus so often in their mouths, so bitter, so foolish, as Balthazar Castillo notes of them, that they cannot speak, but they must bite. They had rather lose a friend than a jest, and what company soever they come in, they will be scoffing, insulting over their inferiors, especially over such as any way depend upon them, humouring, misusing, or putting gulleries on some or other, till they have made by their humouring or gulling ex stulto insanum, a mope or a noddy, and all to make themselves merry. De modo risum, ex utiat sibi, non hic quiquam parcit amico. Friends, neuters, enemies, all are as one, to make a fool a madman, is their sport and they have no greater felicity than to scoff and deride others. They must sacrifice to the god of laughter, with them in Apuleius, once a day, or else they shall be melancholy themselves. They care not how they grind and misuse others, so they may exhilarate their own persons. Their wits indeed serve them to that sole purpose, to make sport, to break a scurral jest, which is levissimus ingenii fructus, the froth of wit, as Tully holds, and for this they are often applauded, in all other discourse, dry, barren, straminous, dull and heavy, here lies their genius. In this they alone excel, please themselves and others. Leo Decimus, that scoffing pope, as Jovius has registered in the fourth book of his life, took an extraordinary delight in humouring of silly fellows, and to put gulleries upon them, by commending some, persuading others to this or that. He made ex dolidis stultissimos, ex maxime ridiculos, ex stultis insanos, soft fellows, stark noddies, and some as were foolish, quite mad before he left them. One memorable example he recites there, of Tarascomus of Parma, a musician that was so humoured by Leo Decimus, and Bibiena his second in this business, that he thought himself to be a man of most excellent skill, who was indeed a ninny. They made him set foolish songs, and invent new ridiculous precepts, which they did highly commend, as to tie his arm that played on the lute, to make him strike a sweeter stroke, and to pull down the arras hangings, because the voice would be clearer, by reason of the reverberation of the wall. In the like manner they persuaded one bower Ballius of Caeta that he was as good a poet as Petrarch, would have him to be made a laureate poet, and invite all his friends to his instalment, and had so possessed the poor man with the conceit of his excellent poetry, that when some of his more discreet friends told him of his folly, he was very angry with them, and said they envied his honour and prosperity. It was strange, saith Jovius, to see an old man of sixty years, a venerable and grave old man, so gulled. But what cannot such scoffers do, especially if they find a soft creature on whom they may work? Nay, to say truth, who is so wise or so discreet that may not be humoured in this kind, especially if some excellent wits shall set upon him? He that mads others, if he were so humoured, would be as mad himself, as much grieved and tormented. He might cry with him in the comedy, Pro Jupiter tu homo me, adigas ad ansanium. For all is in these things as they are taken. If he be a silly soul, and do not perceive it, tis well. He may haply make others sport, and be no whit troubled himself. But if he be apprehensive of his folly, and take it to heart, then it torments him worse than any lash, a bitter jest, a slander, a calumny, pierceth deeper than any loss, danger, bodily pain, or injury whatsoever. Leviter enim volat, 
it flies swiftly, as Bernard of an arrow, sed graviter vulnerat, but wounds deeply, especially if it shall proceed from a virulent tongue it cuts, saith David, like a two-edged sword. They shoot bitter words as arrows, Psalm 65, 5, and they smote with their tongues, Jeremiah 28, 18, and that so hard that they leave an incurable wound behind them. Many men are undone by this means, moped and so dejected, that they are never to be recovered, and of all other men living, those which are actually melancholy, or inclined to it, are most sensible, as being suspicious, choleric, apt to mistake, and impatient of an injury in that kind. They aggravate, and so meditate continually of it, that it is a perpetual corrosive, not to be removed till time wear it out. Although they peradventure that so scoff, do it alone in mirth and merriment, and hold it optimum aliena frui insania, an excellent thing to enjoy another man's madness, yet they must know that it is a mortal sin, as Thomas holds, and as the prophet David denounceth, they that use it shall never dwell in God's tabernacle. Such scurrilous jests, flouts, and sarcasms, therefore, ought not at all to be used, especially to our betters, to those that are in misery, or are any way distressed, for to such, arum narum incrementa sunt, they multiply grief, and as he perceived, in multus pudor, in multus eracundia, etc. Many are ashamed, many vexed, angered, and there is no greater cause or furtherer of melancholy. Martin Cromerus, in the sixth book of his history, hath a pretty story to this purpose, of Vladislaus, the second king of Poland, and Peter Dunius, Earl of Shrine. They had been hunting late, and were enforced to lodge in a poor cottage. When they went to bed, Vladislaus told the Earl in jest, that his wife lay softer with the abbot of Shrine. He, not able to contain, replied, Et tua cum dabesso, and yours with dabessus, a gallant young gentleman in the court, whom Christina the Queen loved. Tegit id dictum principis animum. These words of his so galled that he was long after tristis et cogitabundus, very sad and melancholy for many months. But they were the earl's utter undoing. For when Christina heard of it, she persecuted him to death. Sophia the Empress, Justinian's wife, broke a bitter jest upon Narsetes the eunuch, a famous captain then disquieted for an overthrow which he lately had that he was fitter for a distaff and to keep women company than to wield a sword, or to be the general of an army. But it cost her dear, for he so far distasted it, that he went forthwith to the adverse part, much troubled in his thoughts, caused the Lombards to rebel, and thence procured many miseries to the commonwealth. Tiberius the emperor withheld a legacy from the people of Rome, which his predecessor Augustus had lately given and perceiving a fellow round a dead course in the ear, would needs know wherefore he did so. The fellow replied that he wished the departed soul to signify to Augustus the commons of Rome were yet unpaid. For this bitter jest the emperor caused him forthwith to be slain, and carry the news himself. For this reason all those that otherwise approve of jest in some causes, and facit companions, as who doth not, let them laugh and be merry. Rupantur et illa codro. "'Tis laudable and fit. "'Those yet will by no means admit them in their companies, "'that are any way inclined to this malady. "'Non jocandum cum eis qui misery sunt, et arum nosi, "'no jesting with a discontented person. "'Tis Castilio's caveat, Johannes Pontanus and Galateus, "'and every good man's. "'Play with me, but hurt me not. "'Jest with me, but shame me not. Comitas is a virtue between rusticity and scurrility. Two extremes. As affability is between flattery and contention, it must not exceed, but be still accompanied with that abla bea, or innocency. Quae nemini nocet, omnem injuriae, oblationum abhorrens. Hurts no man, abhors all offer of injury. Though a man be liable to such a jest or obloquy, have been overseen, or committed a foul fact, Yet it is no good manners or humanity to upbraid, to hit him in the teeth with his offence, or to scoff at such a one. Tis an old axiom, turpis in rium omnis exprobatio. I speak not of such as generally tax vice, Barclay, Gentilis, Erasmus, Agrippa, Fiscatus, etc., the Varonists and Lucians of our time, 
satirists, epigrammists, comedians, apologists, etc., but such as personate, rail, scoff, calumniate, perstring by name, or in presence offend. Ludit qui stolida procacitate, non est cestius ille sed cabalus. Tis horseplay this, and those jests, as he saith, are no better than injuries, biting jests, mordentes et aculeati, they are poisoned jests, leave a sting behind them, and ought not to be used. Set not thy foot to make the blind to fall, nor willfully offend thy weaker brother, nor wound the dead with thy tongue's bitter gall, neither rejoice thou in the fall of other. If these rules could be kept, we should have much more ease and quietness than we have, less melancholy, whereas on the contrary we study to misuse each other, how to sting and gall, like two fighting boars, bending all our force and wit, friends, fortune, to crucify one another's souls, by means of which there is little content and charity, much virulency, hatred, malice, and disquietness among us. End of section 42